Can you please help me strengthen my relationships? Will the help be shitty? Only if you're shitty at looking for help. You have to do the work. I had to email over 72 therapists before two got back to me. Okay. A lot got back to me, but said I couldn't help you. When I emailed those 72 therapists, about 15 or so got back to me and said, hey, Brittany, it doesn't sound like I'm the person to help you, which is amazing of them. So it's not just a cash grab. They said, hey, I'm not the person to help you. I recommend somebody in this work of therapy. And I said, okay. And so I reached out to more and more therapists. Like you have to be the, dis the discerner. Just like I had a shitty first therapist, I had to fire her. Yes. Congratulations. You're going to have to do some of the work, you fucking lazy bums. You're going to have to do some of the fucking work. Yes, you. It's your life. If you come on, you're going to have to do some of the work. Okay. You're going to have to find the right therapists, find the right doctors, find the right answers. Yes, you're going to have to do some of the fucking work and then you're going to get the help you need because it's a it's a, a thing you never do truly alone because you can't study every field of medicine. You can't study every field of psychology. You can't study every field of everything in order to know how to help yourself. You have to rely on other people that have spent their life studying. We stand on the shoulders of giants. So we're going to watch Asmin reacting to Dr. K so I can get both their opinions at the same time. I really... I already made a video on this Dr. K thing that went viral. I actually really heavily related to what Dr. K was saying as a woman who spent her life wanting to unalive herself, you know, and nobody really understanding it. I think the therapist that I had that I feel like really saved my life really understood um, unaliving. Like she really knew how to handle me. She was so considerate. She talked to me like a person. What I've noticed as a reaction about what Dr. K said, and we'll get into it, is people are so afraid. They're like so afraid that they end up smothering the person or smothering people in their life. And because they're so afraid, they think they're helping when they're making it actually like way worse for people. So I found that my therapist was really good at not smothering me and she understood why I wanted to like unalive myself, you know, and she validated the reality that like, yeah, like I had come to a really reasonable solution given the tools that I had. And then she said, what if I gave you more tools? And I said, cool. And she gave me more tools. And it's true. I stopped wanting to unalive myself eventually. Now, it wasn't just the tools she gave me. I also had to do a lot of philosophy work. I had to be introspective. I had to ask myself, why was I even trying to get better? So let's jump into this video of Asmin reacting, and then we'll go to Dr. K's live show. Thank you guys for the nice comments about how I look. I appreciate that. I bought a new dress. Thank you. So green. I was like, I feel like green. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Okay, let's just get started because I want to jump in and see what Dr. K is going, going to say today. Okay, here's Dr. K attacked on Twitter from Asmin. So people are pissed off at Dr. K. So the number one thing that correlates with male suicide is not depression. And this is super scary. There's one study I saw recently that suggests that 50% of men who kill themselves have no history or evidence of mental illness. Mental illness is not what we often use it as as well. I say mental illness all the time, but that's actually the incorrect language. It's not, there's a difference between mental illness and like other mentally related problems. And so I think that also coincides with how people are acting. Like sometimes people will call being autistic mental illness and I'm like, oh, like that's one way to look at autism, but that's not necessarily, I'm not sure if autism is technically a mental illness like that, right? Like that's, or even borderline isn't a mental illness. So when we talk about mental health, even I sometimes often make the mistake because I'm not a therapy channel or a mental health channel. Even I make the mistake of saying, oh, mental illness. But a lot of us aren't walking around with mental illnesses, we're, we're having relationships with processing. We're having relationships with, with irregulation. We're having uh, issues with trauma, but that doesn't necessarily mean mental illness. So when Dr. K says men don't necessarily have a mental illness, right? People can't imagine that because in their heads, they're thinking you have to be mentally ill in a specific way to ever want to unalive yourself. And that's just not true. Right. That's just not true. And I think if you keep thinking that's true, you're going to run into the mistake that people were running into on Twitter, which is making people who want to unalive themselves almost want to do it more. Like genuinely, I saw so many comments saying like, bro, like the way people talk about and are reacting to Dr. K makes me want to unalive myself even more. 
Because it's like, how are you ever going to feel seen and purposeful in a world that doesn't even understand you? You know, it's very interesting. Oh. And this, I, I believe the statistic in, in my clinical practice because I know what depression looks like. I know what bipolar disorder looks like. And half the men that I've worked with, at least, mm -hmm. are not actually mentally ill. See, mental illness means a pathology of the mind, which means that the mind is malfunctioning. Most of the suicidal men that I work with, they're not, their mind isn't malfunctioning. They genuinely have a life that is no longer worth living. It's the meaning crisis, which is what Verveke talks about. It's the philosophy aspect, which is what I talk about. Mental health therapy is useless without philosophy. What is the reason to get better? What's the reason to see a therapist if after you're done with therapy, you still don't know why you want to keep living? Living just to live isn't enough for a lot of people, especially introspective people. I actually think the more introspective you are, the more of a reason you need a why to why you exist. If you're not introspective and you're kind of, you know, just going with the motions, you're less likely to need a reason because the reason is given to you by the bubble. And so you already like you're just going to do what people tell you to do, which is fine. And we love that. But I think the more introspective you are, the more likely you are to say, wait, why do I want to keep living? Why do I want to do this thing? Why do I want to go to work? Why is this my life? Which causes a lot of like m a lot of questions that if they're not answered, you're going to start coming to the quote rational conclusion that ending your life is better than continuing your life. They're looking at things and objectively mm -hmm. realizing that there's no way out of the situation. So they turn to suicide. Yep. So I know it's kind of like a Strat very yeah, controversial statement, but I think that's what my clinical practice has shown. And there's some research to even back that up. So the number one thing. So that people are mad about this. People are pissed off. And it's like, obviously, he's not saying that they should kill themselves. He's talking right. about it from their perspective, right? It's like, I haven't seen the context, but like, tell me, am I wrong? That's clear. People literally thought Dr. K was telling people to unalive themselves. People are so lacking and awareness that they thought that clip was Dr. K saying you should unalive yourself. That's how brain dead the internet is. Really why? It's like from their perspective, they think that their life isn't going to get any better. So like they logically come to this conclusion rather than come to this conclusion through a manifestation of some sort of actual pathology of the mind, like he says. But people don't understand that and they're getting pissed off at him, right? This is crazy. Why live your life is stupid. Well, why not take a huge risk? What do you have to lose? Well, that's that's again what you have to teach people, right? And that's clearly what the point is. Life's not worth living is bullshit intended to pander to social media audience. Listen to this. This guy, this guy reading his tweets made me want to go, bro, he's so annoying. Noah Smith, I don't know who he is, but he's so fucking dumb. We, he probably has the best intentions, though. That's a problem. The road to hell is paved in the, good, the best intentions. He says, I've had three friends who committed suicide, all of them men. Two were married. One had a four-year-old daughter. All of them had lots of close friends. One was, highly, one was a highly paid surgeon. Lives not worth not lives not worth living in quotes is bullshit intended to pander to social media. I'm sorry. What is like he goes on to say, because I retweeted this as well. And I was like, you don't care. Like he doesn't know how to care for people who want to unalive themselves. The same people that deal with suicidal people be like, don't, don't you want to stay for your kids? Don't you want to stay for your mom? Well, obviously not. There must be a deeper reason to stay alive than just your kids, bro. Like you, you have to have a deeper reason because you are a single consciousness separate from your children. Yes. Out of an obligation of what I think is morally correct, you would give your child their best existence, which means a father, a mother, a parent, right? But in the mind of somebody who wants to unalive themselves, they know their kid's eventually going to grow up and go on life without them. They eventually might not even have a relationship with their kids. Not everybody has a relationship with their kids. I'm not saying it's logical, meaning like the most good and rational decision, but it's with the, within the tools they have, they make these decisions. I've had a few people unalive themselves in my life. I've had enough stories told to me. It's always the most like, oh my gosh, I'm so shocked you did that, given your life. But that's the problem. We weren't asking them the consciousness. We were always looking at their jobs, their family, their friends. We were never looking at them as an individual. When I say introspection, when I say knowing yourself, the consciousness, I don't mean your family and your kids and your job. See how we're telling these people your life is worth living? Look at your job. Look at your kids. Look at everything outside of you. They're having an internal conflict, internal, and you keep trying to use external to fix it. It's an internal conflict. 
It's like these people have no idea why people would want to unalive themselves because in their brains, they're so extra, like they're, they're so um, externally driven. And I think internally driven people are more likely to also unalive themselves. This is anecdotal. I don't know anything. I'm not going off data. I'm just going off lived experience. It's like very difficult to imagine that like, yeah, dude, it's not just about like, you know, what you have. That's why rich, wealthy people are also unhappy and want to unalive themselves. But they also come to the conclusion, like, if this is all there is, I'm out. But there's so much more to life, and it's definitely not what Noah thinks it is. I think there's so much more to life, but it's definitely what not, it's not your kids. It's not your work. It's not those things. It's something greater and deeper, but it's also a construct. So you might not find value in it in the way that I do. Anyways, I hated this guy's tweet. As if like that's the reason, you know, what a guilt trip too. You better stay alive. You have a Lamborghini. You better stay alive. You have friends. It's like, bro, that's not a reason to stay alive. The reason to stay alive comes from an internal understanding of your own meaning as a consciousness. No, like, bro, I feel like that sometimes, right? Like, I remember whenever I was younger, like, I thought to myself, I was like, damn, like, whenever I get older, my life is just going to suck dick more and more every year. Like, why am I alive, right? Because, like, if you are, like, I don't know, like, especially under 21, things are going up, right? But, like, whenever you get to, like, I don't know, a bit after that, you're going to feel like, oh, now things are going down. You know, now you're going to have more health problems. Now you're going bald. Your parents are aging. You have to get a job. Like, when's, like, what's the next good thing that's going to happen to you? And it's like, if you can't find that, you don't know where that is in your life. Of course you're going to fucking think that. Doesn't mean that you're mentally ill. It means that you're not. You can see what's going on in your own own fucking life doesn't mean you should kill yourself it's not the solution but that's the way people mm, ingrid says it's not anecdotal dr k actually talks about that in his most recent video that people are more internal people who are more internally driven are more likely to get stuck in negative feedback loops that makes sense see i don't know that based off data i just know that based off of like my intuition and my lived experience but yeah that makes sense and again i think everyone fits into categories and so when dr k is talking if you don't resonate with his words you're probably not in that category right People feel you have to understand that like if you want a tweet to do really well on Twitter you have to make the tweet stupid because if the tweet tries to communicate an idea it won't work because people on Twitter are stupid the best argument is not an argument you have to make people think something by uh, some form of other emotional persuasion and I think that like really what this shows is like in my opinion like this is in a way like actual empathy where you can legitimately see the way another person feels mm -hmm. like you actually try to put yourselves in that person's shoes and think about how that person actually feels in the situation rather than just going and it didn't matter matter how much i was loved that was never the reason i stopped wanting to unalive myself i was deeply loved by the people around me it didn't matter it's wonderful and that's great but the issue I was having was an internal conflict with my own consciousness and my own meaning. I was having a meaning crisis. So, of course, when I looked at the world and I said, this is your meaning, well, I don't fit inside of this meaning. This isn't enough for me. I need something more. I need something different. I had to construct that meaning in a way that fulfilled me. So I stopped wanting to unalive myself. Four years clean, y'all. Four years of not wanting to unalive myself. Before, I had wanted to unalive myself and I had attempted a few times since I was the age of like eight years old. So again, you know, when we're having this conversation, this is why philosophy is so meaningful to me, but not in the way that they're like, Are you, what's your, what philosophy do you identify with? It's like, Ugh, that meaning, I don't identify, I don't identify with any of your labels, bro. Relax. People who garner meaning from an obsession of labeling themselves within a construct like that's not relatable to me see that's what was driving me crazy some lady was talking to wick yesterday and had the audacity to name drop me i think i've i've been on a panel with her before i don't know people's names she seems very lovely but obviously so in her bubble and she was saying you know britney simon i was like that's me she's like i bet she loves the body keeps the score yeah i've read a few chapters i like the book but i haven't finished it and also i have mentioned it to people because like i think you should read all books I've read over thousands of books. All of them have been helpful, even the ones I hated. 
She's like, I bet Brittany Simon loves The Body Keeps the Score. And I bet she like loves it. Like people are obsessed. And I was like, okay, you're making a lot of assumptions. It's just a book. I literally think all things are valuable if they can teach you something. Nobody should, in my opinion, for my journey, obsessing with a label, obsessing with a book. The Bible isn't even the Bible. She was like, people read The Body Keeps the Score like it's the Bible. Not even the Bible is like the Bible. I am not in this group think, this group think of obsessing over one thing and being like, this is it. This is the answer to the universe. That is not how my brain works. That is what was driving me to suicide, like suicide. Because everybody kept saying, everybody kept saying, if you just find God, if you just find the book, if you just find this thing. And I'm like, Ugh. none of that is working for me. Everybody was just upset. If you just find this thing, I was never going to find a thing. Because nothing a human created was ever going to be singularly the thing that made me stop wanting to die. I obviously was having a crisis within my consciousness. So for this lady, God bless her, to assume so much of me is just like sh her showing her bubble and that's fine. It's just a book. And if it helps you, awesome. And if it doesn't help you, cool. But you shouldn't be worshiping a book. You shouldn't be worshiping a God. And you shouldn't be worshiping a man. Period. So if you find yourself deciding your whole life is based off of a construct, you do you, but not my thing. Okay, not my thing. And the fact that people think it's my thing is just a projection of their own, like how they process reality. So my, my desire to like kill myself came from my inability to understand like none of these things are fitting me and everything seems so dead end. Everything I tried to do, every bubble I tried to join was like a dead end. Religion was a dead end. Being obsessed with like, oh, this author said this and this radio host said this and this YouTuber said this, dead end. I don't dedicate my whole life to Dr. K or Kirk Honda or Mr. Beast, like what, dead end. My consciousness is having a relationship with itself. It is not having an external process. It's not validating its, its uniqueness or its importance by external validation. I'm not externally motivated as a person. And it took me a really long time to realize that. And I think people think, they think everyone is externally motivated. It's not. Not everybody is that way. So it doesn't matter if you have a Bugatti or millions of dollars or 10 kids. That might not be reason enough to keep going. Yaya says, what were the first thoughts in your head when you started thinking about suicide? What was the first trigger within yourself at such a young age? Well, I don't know now, but I think it was just wanting to be free. Right? Right? Wanting to feel uh, safe. Wanting to feel uh, like I could breathe again. And being like, well, this is what I would do. And this is my viewpoint. And so you should do the way that you should do it the way that I think that it should happen. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, that's not you. That's not you, bro. Like, what is this? Yeah, so correct her. Yeah. And, and like, I think that this this post here. It goes to show that how little people actually have empathy. They don't uh -huh. really have any empathy. They just want to hear their viewpoint repeated. And they view people that, uh, you know, repeat their viewpoint as empathetic and people who don't as not. So much of the, like, dialogue and so much of the, like, self-help and shit like this on the Internet is actually, in my this is my opinion, is only there to make people feel good about bad decisions that they've already made and justify future bad decisions. Mm. Lexi says, 10 year anniversary for the last time I self-harmed is next month. It's hard for people who haven't gone through it to understand, but people bringing up my family just made me feel guilty, did not help, for sure. It's not actually there to challenge the individual. It's not there to improve their life. It's there to validate their pre-existing notions and make them feel like they're doing the right thing. And so we shouldn't, it shouldn't justify it. Yeah, exactly. And so like, this is why, for example, you have all these people, like whenever I say that, you know, you should stop, uh, you know, spending all your time on the internet playing video games all the time, uh, people get mad about this and they say like, oh, well, you know, if like, if your job is bad, you should work towards getting a better job. People get mad about this. Why do they get mad about this? It's very simple because people don't want to hear that what they're doing is wrong. You know what's interesting? Some feedback I get as of late really is interesting to me. They'll say, 
I'll say, um, they'll say I'm miserable at home. I hate living with my parents. I'm in my early to late to 20s to early 30s. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, move out. And they're like, people can't just move out, Brittany. Life is expensive. Okay. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I... Like, my brain is thinking, like, think about what your ancestors had to go through to just get meat once a week. Like, think about what people's lives must have been like. Like, yes, it's difficult. No, it, life is hard, period. But also, you know what I mean? Like, you got to pick and choose your battles. You've got to learn how to suffer wisely. You got to pick and choose your battles. So if living at home is fucking with you, you got to figure out how to get out of there, which is like very difficult. But in the long run, it's like better. But also, you don't have to do anything. But also, if you want to change your life, you have to do you have to live differently. And that's why it's so difficult. And then people have the audacity to sit there and tell me they're introspective and wise and they know what they're doing with their life. But all they do is fucking complain. And all they do is loop in the same lifestyle with the same friends and the same back and forths. And they're like, what could be the problem? Probably you, bro. So the, the type of like self-help that happens on the Internet is generally actually toxic because all it does in the popular stuff is that it just tells people that the bad thing that you're doing is actually OK and it's not your fault. It's like the reason why you spend 12 hours a day jerking off to furry porn for animals that don't exist isn't because there's something wrong with you and you need to get a job. No, it's because of capitalism and Donald Trump. Like the reason why you can't get a girlfriend isn't because you have 35 different figurines of lollies that like you don't want to shine a black light on them on. That's not the reason why you can't get a girlfriend. It's because of hoflation and women nowadays only want to fuck chads and the Internet is out to get me. Like and this is the thing, right? So it's like, why is it you just always get to hear the thing that reaffirms what you're already doing? It's hoflation. Yeah, that's right, guys. And so this is what happens, right? And so like whenever you have somebody like Dr. K who's actually trying to help people, who's actually trying to help people and isn't afraid of, you know, like, oh, somebody might take this the wrong way or whatever, treats people like adults, you see the, um, the programming with people that have so many different levels of learned helplessness that are just like hard-coded into them. They're just malfunctioning because they're not hearing the thing that makes them feel good. You're right, fucking NPCs. That's right. Drives. No, this is so true. Okay. Fuck this is so true because um, remember that incel documentary we were watching? Shout out to Asmin. We were watching that incel documentary, and the guy's like, "I'm not sure what's keeping women away from me." And then you walk into his room, and his whole wall is full of lolly posters. I was like, "Um, probably the lolly posters, bro. <laughs> like, why are you into lolly? Like, again." I'm, you know, I'm happy to sit here and like dissect the nuance, but for me, and I'm so like, I'm so open-minded, but like lolly stuff is like, that's, that's going to turn off a grown woman. You know, it just should turn off a grown woman. In my opinion, I think it should turn off a grown man. I think it should turn off people. Like, I think lolly should be a deal breaker to some extent. You know, if you're heavy, if you have posters on your wall. And this kid seemed nice enough, but he had posters on his wall of like lolly figurines, like in the most sexual positions. And it's like, oh, yeah, like how is that going to turn on a grown up? You know what I mean? Like, how's that going to work for somebody that's healthy and mature? And so, again, like healthy people date healthy people. And I think unhealthy people are in toxic relationships. So, you know, OK, so Dr. K has started. I am going to find the beginning of when he comes on. All righty, chat. Let's get started. So, so this is live right now. We're behind the the stream, obviously, but my hair is a little bit messed up today. Welcome to another Healthy Gamer GG stream. My name is Alo Kenoja. Just a reminder. Uh oh, do we have lag? Okay, we're gonna. Is we'll he kind of low? Just a reminder that although I'm a psychiatrist, nothing we discuss on stream today is intended to be taken as medical advice. Everything is for educational and entertainment purposes only. If y'all have a medical concern or question, please go see a licensed professional. That's very true, especially about what we're going to talk about today, because we are going to talk about suicide and specifically in men. And I'm going to try to clarify a couple of things that I said 
Um, I wish I could say they were taken out of context, but honestly, I think there was some amount of fair context there. And then we're also going to do something. So, so we're and, and then we're going to talk about that because I did this thing where I showed up on the internet. And I was recently on a podcast called Diary of a CEO. This podcast has gotten a lot of views. People started posting clips about it, and then oh, my favorite thing, <laughs> my favorite thing happened on the internet. People started reacting to it, and so I'm new to this kind of thing. Um, but now what I'm going to do, because I understand this is how things happen, is I'm going to react to some of the reactions. And what I'd love to do is clarify a little bit about what I was saying, um, but then also continue to talk about this, because I think this is like really important to understand. And I think some people on the internet like seem to, I, I don't, I don't want to say that they misinterpreted what I, I was going to say, because I think technically that's not what happened. I think they made some assumptions about things that I was saying, which I don't think are correct. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And then, then what I'd really like to do is I'm going to show you all like a bucket of research about why I believe what I believe, what this means for you, and then hopefully at the end, I will share with y'all what I think we should do in some way about male suicide. I haven't really fleshed that part out yet. By the way, I am a woman who very much identified with his talking about male suicide, and I think that's sort of like important to recognize as well, is I'm not convinced it's too gendered, at least if you are a person like me, and this is why everyone always references me as a boy. This is why I even identify sort of like, almost like gender fluid, if you will, but like, when he talks about men and their reasoning, in some ways, like that internal compass is exactly my relationship with it. So it's interesting that we're specifying male suicide because he has a male audience and it's geared towards men. But it's so ironic how helpful it is to people who are ready, ready to get better and how unhelpful it is to people who refuse to get better. Even who, with people who don't want to commit suicide, the way they want to support the men in their life is so through their own lens that they don't understand like, you're not the reason people kill themselves, but you're kind of a contributing factor to the meaningless part of it, which is like very funny because they but make it about themselves. They make it about themselves. It's so ironic. I feel like ranting a little bit, so we'll see where it goes. Okay. So a couple of other things just to keep in mind. So sometimes when I talk about things, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of my clinical experiences. Um, a couple of other things to keep in mind. Sometimes when I talk about clinical experiences, they will include things that are clinically relevant, which is, is kind of like my way of saying, I guess this is like a trigger warning because I'm going to be like sharing some of my clinical experiences working with people who are suicidal working with and by the way people like i think you have the right to live and die how you want right at the end of the day you do every grown adult does and look some people are going to be a part of a population that like will never get the help they need because they'll never do the work they need to to get better genuinely a lot of the reasons people end up killing themselves is because they want to and you need to get over it like you need to accept the fact that these adult people or even young people will have a moment in their life where regardless of what you try to tell them to do, you're not their mother and father, and you're certainly not their God. They're going to make a decision. And some part of the population is going to be that decision. And you acting like a martyr, you acting like we could have saved them. Somebody could have saved them. They could have saved them. And they chose not to because their version of being saved didn't look like your version of a result. And ultimately, that is the most real thing about suicide that nobody wants to talk about. Some of you all don't realize your bullshit solutions are not solutions. People get to make decisions about how they live and die. And if you disagree, I think you're more than likely contributing to the uptick in suicidal ideation. Funny enough. People who have been traumatized or abused, things like that. As always, and if you guys don't know this, whenever I talk about these things, everything that I talk about is chimerical, which means that like, if I say like the, I saw a patient who was xyz like i change all that stuff out to protect privacy but the essence i do that too when i tell stories i change like little details here and there just to make sure like people don't get confused for other people you know what i mean so the story is true and it's usually like multiple people that this applies this to yeah yeah okay? yeah yeah. i agree so there's a couple of quick disclaimers so um a couple of other simple things so one is that if you are someone who's struggling with suicide i strongly 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 urge you to seek mental health help from a professional um, in the, you know, if you're actually in danger today, please go seek emergency services called 911 in the United States, depending on what country you're in. It's like there are a lot of communities that can help you Chew blue. That is not what I'm saying. Bernice, so right. Pull yourself by your bootstraps, people. That's not what I'm saying. But you have to actually be ready to ask for help to get help. It's not pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. That's a narrative that like lacks community effort. You need a community. You never do anything alone. Right. I needed my therapist. I needed my philosophy. I needed like people I talked to ultimately to get the tools to stop wanting un to unalive myself. So you don't pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but you got to ask for help. And that comes from you. If people force help onto you, sometimes it's good. A lot of times it doesn't work. Obviously, you can bring a horse to water. You can't force it to drink. 
though many of people try. So 112 or all kinds of other things. Um, I, and, and hopefully, if you don't feel like doing that quite yet, uh, I will make an argument by the end of wherever we end up today as to why that is a good idea and the right move. OK, so let's start with the reactions. Oh, my God. Exciting. Okay, So Dr. K did something silly. OK, I did something silly. And that silly thing was I opened my mouth. And then the rest of the general Internet was paying attention for once. And let's see what happened. Oh, OK. Looks like you guys do not have a audio input here. Let me see if uh -oh. I can add one the real quick. Is about can Dr. Happen. K add a tech support check? Um, audio output capture. Oh, uh, desktop oh. audio. Boomer moment. Let's call it this. And then default device. I kind of okay, feel that. Let's see this works. Suicide. Okay, there we go. Okay, here we go. Right, so here we go. For this, some reason, this video seems pretty quiet to me. Um, so y'all may have to turn up the volume a little bit. It's Dr. jacked K up all the, all the way over here. Okay, but let's just listen to it. All right. So the number one thing that correlates with male suicide is not depression. He's just going in the scary. video again. There's one study I saw recently that suggests that 50% of men who kill themselves have no history or evidence of mental illness. And this, I, I believe the statistic in, in my clinical practice because I know what depression looks like. I know what bipolar disorder looks like. And half the men that I've worked with, at least, are not actually mentally ill. See, mental illness means a pathology of the mind, which means that the mind mental is illness functional. means a pathology Most of the mind. He's just repeating the clip. I know it's so low, I can barely hear it. They genuinely have a life that is no longer worth living. They're looking at things and objectively realizing that there's no way out of the situation. So they turn to suicide. So I know it's kind of like a very controversial statement, but I think that's what my clinical practice has shown. And there's some research to even back that up. Okay. So I think there's there's a lot of things here. Okay. So this is what I said. Um, we'll show you the papers in, in a little bit. Um, and, and I think some people are getting uh, caught up in this word objective, which, so just a quick kind of disclaimer. So like, yeah. you know, so this is challenging when you're speaking about stuff on the internet. Is that like everything, so if I'm giving a talk about male suicide, there's enough space in the talk to add the nuance, add the complexity, add the disclaimers. And then the context matters and language means so much. Oh my God, it's so different. I just got a comment today that like blew my mind at their response to me. I'm like, holy fuck, language is so different the space is so specific. People hear you one way and they don't. They they took Dr. K so out of context for this. For this, People went crazy on Twitter, literally saying that he thought like Dr. K was saying, just give up on your life and kill yourself. And I'm like, where did you get that from? Where did you get that? This whole podcast is about helping men not kill themselves. It's just so insane, bro. And sometimes when you do something like go on a podcast, you are by necessity forced to simplify things. Because like you're making another point. Like so in this video, I'm not talking about male suicide is the primary point. I'm using it as a statistic to talk about in context with a larger conversation. So just to give you all like a, a quick heads up, like the whole interview was like two and a half hours. I think it got edited down to like one hour and eight minutes. And I'm not saying that they did a bad job or anything like that. That's just how things go, right? Like I may have scratched my ball somewhere in the middle of the interview and they chose to edit that out. Thank you all very much from Diary of a CEO. I think they did a great job with editing. I'm not saying that I got taken out of context or anything like that. Now let's look at some, some of the reactions, right? So why live if your life is stupid? Well, why not take a huge risk? What do you have to lose? That's how you should teach depressed men to think. Fuck it, bro. Go all in. You're already dead. It's all upside from here. So I think that this is like one example of one of the, the responses, right? Is like, if someone's life sucks, what do you have to lose? Why do you not take a huge risk? I don't know why this person put depressed in quotes. I, I'm not, I'm confused about what that means, but I think it's like some people kind of feel this way, right? So this is like kind of good. It's like kind of positive, right? Like, like, you know, I guess I'm not sure. Um, and, like and, and then hold on, let me, this is that Noah guy. He drove me crazy. His tweets drove me the craziest. I can, God, I can't stand myself talk. I've had three <laughs> friends who committed suicide. All of the men, two were married. One had a four year old daughter. All of them had lots of close friends. One was highly paid service. Lives worth living is bullshit intended to pander to a social media audience. So when, when I, when I first saw this tweet, you know, I got a little bit upset and I was like, oh my God, right. This person doesn't understand what I'm saying. I, I think that, you know, like, I, but let's remember like this is X or Twitter, right? And this is, that's a good point. Tiger says suicide is a boogeyman to some people. It really is. And they need to get the fuck over it. And remember, like, again, depending on your bubble, you might not even believe in therapy or mental health. Literally listening to Wix panel yesterday made me want to like my brain was rotting. He even invited me to come on. But I no offense, like I can't talk to people that are certain kinds of people I just can't engage with because they're so close minded that I'm like, I there's no so you're not interested in solutions. You're only interested in they're so afraid. They're so afraid. And shout out to these two women. No offense. They're just so afraid to have a nuanced conversation about therapy or alternative methods or even like the fact that therapy is a construct. Everything about the world is a construct and we're figuring things out. And so, you know, when we talk about what helps people, we have to remember that, you know, if you're afraid about something, if you're afraid about a certain reality or context, uh, your fear is it's too much. It's going to suffocate solutions. Now, there needs to be some sort of moral or ethical 
pathway into discovering new things about people. And most of the world's knowledge has been discovered in very unethical ways, right? We torture, we experiment, we take people against their will and give them testing drugs and do things to them that, you know. So obviously moving forward in a modern world, we'd like there to be some more there are more proper ways of doing this, of finding out this information, but a lot of it is shared amongst us. You know, when I went to therapy, I told my therapist what was going on with me and she diagnosed me. I am the client. We have a symbiotic relationship in which I communicate honestly and clearly to her. And she takes that data and goes, okay, based on what you're saying, you have this. And then we have lots of, you know, conversations and we go back and forth and we do DBT and we, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it's a relationship. It's not like the therapist sees you and without you saying a word goes, ah, oh, yes, you have mommy issues and mm, autism. And mm. it's not like the therapist is reading your brain. You have a relationship with your therapist. You guys together are putting a label to this thing you're experiencing. And it could be the wrong label or the right label or a label that's almost correct, but still gets us to where we need to go. So if you're like, I just remember my therapist being so great. I was telling her about my life and I said, this is why I want to kill myself. And she said, yeah, no wonder that makes sense. Your life sounds very hard. I said, thank you. And she goes, but you don't really want to die, right? I was like, well, I'm going to die if it continues being this hard. And she goes, okay, well, let's make it easier. And I said, okay, I'm open to that. Let's make it easier. And she gave me the tools to alleviate my pain and make it easier. And then I took those tools and I morphed it in conjunction with the tools philosophy gave me and I found my meaning. Therapy didn't give me my meaning. It gave me the tools to calm my brain down long enough, right, to know why I was, my nervous system was freaking out, to understand why I was having the reactions I was having, which, you know, made me realize so much about myself, which gave me the right, like, now I was steady and able to now do the second thing, which was like find my meaning and find my purpose. Therapy doesn't give you a purpose. It just well oils your machine, girl. Okay? Your machine and therapy oils you up, gets you moving. Philosophy gives you a destination. Okay? This is the internet. And what happens like, you know, this was, I wasn't trying to pander to a social media audience. I, I, I thought the way that I, what was in my head is I'm trying to raise awareness about a mental health issue that I think is troubling. Like I don't. I mean, if I was pandering to a social media audience, I think I would have said it in an accent, you know? And, and so my first reaction was that like, okay, this person is like, you know, but I mean, I think the person probably comes from a good place. And let's remember like, why would this person interpret what I'm doing as pandering to a social media audience? I don't know. Maybe because they spend some. What's EMS? Hotels, Hotep, Hotep says, I feel like more, more, most therapists would have phoned EMS. What's EMS? Emergency medical services. So my therapist did uh, have a nurse check in with me once a week. So I was on call. But I told her, I was like, I'm not going to try to kill myself until I'm out of solutions. And I'm not out of solutions yet. And even though I had attempted, you know, I'm like most women, we attempt by severe self-harm and then hope we die in the process. Um, so my I did have a weekly check-in with a nurse. She would call me, make sure I hadn't killed myself. We would talk and it was great. So I had my therapist and then I had a nurse that would call me once a week to check in with me. So she never had to institutionalize me. I was functional. I was working multiple jobs. I had a partner. I had friends. I was living on my own. I was like independent. I was incredibly high functioning. I just wanted to die because I'm a re rational and reasonable person. Some time on this place called the internet where a lot of content creators like this is what we do, right? So I think that this is like a, a helpful comment. If a little bit misdirected, which even then I can't really blame them for, right? Because what are they reacting to? They're reacting to a 50 second clip of a one hour and eight minute video that was edited from a two hour and 30 minute interview. So this is what we have to remember about the internet and Twitter and X and all of these platforms. These are not mm -hmm. places for nuanced discussion. These are places for reactionary content. Okay. So in regards to male suicidal patients, a therapist who believes their minds are not malfunctioning and their lives are not worth living would not be beneficial as the therapist does not attempt to correct or improve their situation. Now, this is where I say this person, I disagree 100%. Chew Blue says, how did the nurse check in with you? You must have been taking medication. I was never on medication. My therapist never saw a need for me to be on medication. We talked about it. We never saw a need to be on it. And the nurse called me. That's all. She just called me, said, hey, Britt, how, how's it going? I said, hey, girl, how's it going? And we chit-chatted for like 45 minutes. And then that was it. She just checked in, see how I was doing. I never took meds while I was in therapy. Never needed meds. 100%. So Not that I'm anti-meds. I'm actually super pro-meds. I'm actually looking into meds for my fibro right now. So very pro-meds. I just didn't need them at the time. A couple of very, very, very important things to consider here.
So let's start with this, okay? I want y'all to really think about, or actually, we'll get to this in a second. So then, <gasps> as I just, wa I just watched this video with you guys. And Gold decided to react to this. Even back that up. So the number one thing- So people are mad about this. People are pissed off. And it's like, obviously, he's not saying that they should kill themselves. He's talking about it from their perspective, right? It's like, I haven't seen the context, but like, tell me, am I wrong? That's clearly why. It's like, from their perspective, they think that their life isn't going to get any better. So like, they logically come to this conclusion rather than come to this conclusion through a manifestation of some sort of actual pathology of the mind, like he says. But people don't understand that and they're getting pissed off at him, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is crazy. Why live your life is stupid. Well, why not take a huge risk? What do you have to lose? Well, that's, that's again, what you have to teach people, right? And that's clearly what the point is. Life's not worth living is bullshit intended to pander to social media audience. No, like, bro, I feel like that sometimes, right? Like, I remember... So, uh, I'm going to pause here for a second. So, I, I want to just... So, if we look at something like this, and th their lives are not worth living, would not be beneficial, okay? So, the first problem that I have with this is... Just because someone doesn't have a malfunction of the mind doesn't mean that we don't try to help them, mm -hmm. right? So, like, I don't know how you say, like, just... In regards to male suicide patients, a therapist who believes their minds are not malfunctioning and their lives are not worth living would not be beneficial as a therapist does not attempt to correct or improve their situation. In regards to male suicide patients, a therapist who believes their minds are not male functioning and their lives are not worth living would not be beneficial. What? Just because someone accurately assesses their life is not having a whole lot of value. Why do you assume that that means we don't try to help or correct it or improve their situation? That's absolutely what we do. Wait, and what? this is where I, I, I want y'all to really understand this. This is what I think is so important to understand. So here is a person. Okay. Now let's look at their life. They have a there oh, are some subjects. I'm so excited about this. Objective aspects to life. And this is like, this is rife with all kinds of problems, subjective, objective. And let's say that there are objective problems with their life. So actually, forget about subjective problems. I'm going to change this a little bit. So let's say that. Wait, Two Blue says, but nurses don't do check weekly check ins like that. Um, one convo makes sense, though. No, it was a weekly check in, a weekly conversation for about 45 minutes. State of Seattle, or state, sorry, state of Washington, Seattle, where I got therapy did have a nurse call me once a week to check in on me. I don't know why you keep saying nurses don't do that. They might not do it where you live, but I, they did it where I lived. They have a malfunctioning mind. So if someone is, is suffering and says, my life sucks, okay? That sucks. And you have a malfunction of the mind. So in the case of clinical depression, one of the key things about mood disorders, like a depressive episode, is that while oftentimes depressive episodes are triggered by negative circumstances, the whole point of the pathology is that this person objectively has lots to live for. So I'm thinking about, so I worked on a particular psychiatric unit called Blake 11 at Massachusetts General Hospital. I was an intern there. And mm -hmm. I would have patients who came in and they were married. They had kids mm -hmm. who loved them. That's why I really do when, when I really do resent the idea that like you'll come to someone and be like, hey, I'm thinking about killing myself. And they're like, you have kids. And it's like, oh, thanks, bro. I didn't know that. But you have a great job. It's like, cool. I didn't realize that. Thanks for letting me know. Like, they're so fucking dumb. Like, you mean so well, but you're so fucking dumb. You think the person who wants to kill themselves doesn't know they have kids? Why are you talking like they're fucking retard? Mm, redundant. <laughs> they had careers. They would go skiing in the wintertime. They even had dogs. So someone comes in and says, I'm suicidal. My family would be better off without me. My kids, like, I know they say they love me, but like, they don't realize how shit of a dad they've got. This is what I would call a malfunction of the mind. So this is a situation where you look at it objectively and you say like, and even then, like you could say, argue what is objective, what is subjective. And this is where when I say objective, like basically what I'm referring to is we can look at research on quality of life and we can take like a thousand human beings and we can say, okay, what is the quality of life of these people? And then like, we can say, these people have a good quality of life. These people have a bad quality of life. We have like research on quality of life. Okay. We can say this person has a malfunctioning mind. Now let's take the case of someone else. Let's say that I am 36 years old. I am a virgin. I have no job. I live at home. I've never had a romantic relationship. I have nothing to look forward to in the sense of like, I'm not going on vacation. I'm not striving for promotion. So when I say like no future, I don't mean like in an abstract philosophical sense. I mean like literally if you sit down and you talk to this person, you ask them, what are you looking forward to over the next year? And they have nothing. They can't think of a single thing that they're looking forward to. Okay. Now we have to be super careful here because if we say the reason that this person is suicidal is because of these things, which are, I would call them objective aspects of their life. We'll get a little bit into the nuance versus the objective aspects of- How about when you tell your parents you're suicidal and they're like, you just need Jesus. And you're like, oh, thanks. I didn't think about that. <laughs> this, this person's life are okay. This person's life suck. Where is the root of the problem here? Now this gets complicated. And like I said, we'll get into this because this leads to cognitive biases and emotional changes and all that kind of stuff. We have to be super careful. Because if we assume that this person's problem is all in their head and they have a malfunction of their mind and actually they're wrong, 
We know your life better than you do. You have a lot to live for. You're just too fucking stupid to understand it. You just need to dig deeper and try harder. Everyone's in a different category. Conrad says depression pep, pep talk. Did you mean talk? Actually worked for me. Look, everything works for different people. If something's not working for you, try a different version. That's what I'm saying. Like I am open-minded to things working for different people. So the reason that WIC panel yesterday was like bothering me is because these women were saying like, there's only one method of therapy. There's only one solution. There's only one way to do things. And it was just exhausting because again, there's 8 billion people on the planet. We're all so nuanced and complex. Like it's not going to work the same for everybody. What worked for me might not work for you. Right. So I love that things that don't work for me might work for you and things that work for, you know, you might not work for me and so on and so forth, you know, these people try way harder than most of us will ever try. Honestly, this is my experience and my understanding of it. Fucking to be. OK, I have a theory about this. I'm so sorry to interrupt, Dr. K. He's on a flow, but I have a theory about this. I am amazed constantly at people who don't want to kill themselves and how often they never try. I am so impressed that people who have never thought about killing themselves make no effort to live a good life. I'm always like, what? As a suicidal person myself, four years, four years out of the desire to kill myself, I've tried so hard because I wanted to kill myself. So when I see people, I'm like, you're doing nothing with your life and you're the one who's like, I'm never going to kill myself. Amazing. Amazing that you would, amazing how you're so satisfied. But then all you do is complain. They complain about everything in their life, do absolutely nothing about it, and don't even think about killing themselves. Amazing. 36 years old and wake up one day and like pull yourself out of bed because I'm fucking happily married and like I've got a two-year-old. I'm tired, but my life is good. I have a reason to get out of bed. What is way harder is to get out of bed when you have no reason to get out of bed. So this is where like, you know, and we'll get to some of this. Like why not take a huge, what do you have to lose? What you have to lose is effort. So if you're 36 years old and you haven't done anything with your life, what do you have to lose? You have more effort with no gain to lose. That is a huge cost. You have futility in oh. your life. This is what the experiences of these people are. Right? So this but is I get why that can, can sound comforting. Like, you have nothing to lose. You might as well try everything. But, like, dying is winning. In the mind of some suicidal people, dying is a relief. So the, dying is one of the good possibilities. So if you're like, why would you want to die? Because you've already, like... Just like you could just, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't make sense to make it negative. So for some people who are suicidal, like that's a perk. Like dying sounds nice. Sounds like a relief. Sounds like I can rest. But for other people, they think dying is like, it's like the worst thing ever. So why not, why not keep living just to, you know what I'm saying? So it's the perception you're having. Everyone thinks dying is so scary. For a lot of us, it just sounds nice. Oh, a nice nap, a relief. I don't have to pay taxes. I don't have to deal with your fucking drama ass. I can just sleep for the rest of my life. What do you mean? Kay says, quote, why would you want the pain to stop? Girl, so interesting, you know. Lexi says, I like listening to Dr. K because you can tell when someone actually knows what they're talking about. Like this is someone who knows they're spitting facts. Bro, I love Dr. K because I think he's actually interested in people. I think a lot of people are only interested in pushing people towards their narrative. I think Dr. K is actually interested in what makes people work, which is why I do love his content is where I don't say like, oh, hey, you're mentally ill. You just your brain, your fucking brain, fucking brain. You don't realize that there's so much to live for. When I say like, I look at these people's lives and I think they objectively look, and this is what I mean by objective. So we call this objective or subjective. I'll give you all a simple example, right? So this person walks into my office, 36 years old, and they have had nothing of consequence in their life that they can remember. Maybe they did somewhere, but generally speaking, they kind of dropped out of college. They just started playing a bunch of fucking video games, watching pornography, you know, like getting, developing parasocial relationships with VTubers. Oh, and like, this is what their life is. Now, if you ask this person, like, what do you have to look forward to? What has your experience of life been like? Just think about this. If you've lived the majority of your 20s and half of your 30s and you have had nothing to look forward to. No, no, no. Conrad, you said, nah, life gets better if you put work into it. That's external motivation. It doesn't get better. You get better is internal motivation. So that saying it gets better. Do you guys remember that campaign? It doesn't get better when you're internally motivated. It is external. So it does not get better. You get better. That's for the internally motivated. When I was doing a promotion for It Gets Better, I changed it to You Get Better because I'm not externally motivated. It getting better is just like, that's meaningless to me if I'm not better. So like it doesn't get better if you're internally motivated. You have to get better. If you're externally motivated, then yeah, don't worry. It, life gets better.
when you put effort into it. Like life, that's the problem is, are you externally motivated or internally motivated? You have to know this about yourself. Why would you logically assume if you've been trying this shit for like 36 years, why would you logically assume that things are going to get magically better in two years or three years or four years or five years? Why would you logically assume that? Right? So human beings are really good at pattern recognition. I'm not saying that their lives are not worth fighting for. And I'm not saying and we'll get to that because I'm against suicide. But what I'm saying is like when I say that, that their lives are objectively shit, like this is, you know, they say that. And this, by the way, was something that was taught to me, which is like, I'll just share this example with y'all. So I, I was working at Massachusetts General Hospital and I was working in the emergency room. There's a brilliant nurse practitioner there. And then she would like see patients and she would come to me and then, you know, we'd like talk about it. I'd say like, okay, what's going on with this person? And then she'd say like, there's six diagnoses in the chart, conduct disorder, polysubstance use. And if you guys know mental health and your mental health profession, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Polysubstance use disorder, um, conduct disorder, PTSD, bipolar disorder, maybe major depressive disorder. Forget the fact that those are mutually exclusive in ADHD. Those are the six diagnoses. But she says, well, I ask her, what's the problem with this kid? She says he has SLS. What is SLS? Shit life syndrome. This is a kid that grew up in a traumatic household was through like a group home and orphanage system, abuse, substance use, no good role models, no prospects, got into trouble at school, got put in this IEP. These kids just, they just never had a chance in life. You can slap as many diagnoses as you want on top of them, which is usually what ends up happening. And then they get medicated all hell. But the problem is that they've just never like, you know, there's so many community, social, mm -hmm. lack of role models, lack of love, lack of support, lack of modeling, lack of emotional mirroring, all this kind of stuff. So first thing, we have to be super careful because if we assume that this is a malfunction of the mind, then what we try to do is fix the malfunction of the mind and we ignore all of this stuff. This, I think, is potentially one of the biggest mistakes that we're making, okay? So let's take a look at a couple other comments. Okay, every man has a life worth living. Doom porn deserves scorn and rebuke. So this, I think, is also where we have to like take a step back and we have to decide a couple of things, okay? So someone says, every man has a life worth living. Now, so one of the things that we try very hard as therapists is to do something called empathize. What does that mean? That means that when someone walks into your office and they say, this is my life, we do our best to meet them where they're at. We do our best to understand as therapists, and maybe this is wrong, but this is, I think is fair, that this person has lived their life every single day. And I have not lived their life every single day. And that the experiences of my life don't necessarily translate over to them. So if someone says every person's life has value, I agree. But the reason that I agree is because of my life. Mm. because I see that my life has value. Every day I've lived with some value. I've thought that I didn't have value. And now I believe that it has value. I agree that all lives have value. But my point is that when someone walks into your office and they say, this is my experience of the world, I think it is the height of arrogance to say you are wrong and I am right because I haven't actually lived a day in the, their shoes. Mm. And I'll tell you, we did this mm. for decades mm. to women because women showed up and said, hey, I'm getting sexually assaulted. And we said, ha ha ha. No, you're not. That is impossible. If you got sexually assaulted, you were asking for it. This is literally the kinds of responses we had. So what was this 2017 Me Too movement about? It was about believe women. Hey, I have a crazy idea. When someone says something about their life, how about we meet them where they're at? We're not saying they're 100% right. And there may be cases, I'm not going to get into the Me Too movement and sexual assault and all that kind of stuff. They're, they're absolutely like, at least in depression and suicidality, there are cognitive distortions and stuff like that. But a good starting point, which I think is like basics of medicine, is like listen to your patients. Mm hear what they have to say, mm. try to understand them. This is the foundation of therapy, mm. is the better that I understand someone else's experience, the more that I will be able to help them. And the whole problem, I've heard so many horror stories of people going in and telling their therapist like, hey, my life sucks. And the therapist is like, no, it doesn't. You just need to see things this way. You just need to do things this way. And that yep. can actually be helpful for some people. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's variability there, there's nuance there. But this is like exactly in a sense what I think the problem is. So here's my take. Okay, so first of all, let's take a look at a couple of these. Um, I think he, uh, they're subjectively determining their life isn't worth living and they're only a few decisions uh, away from feeling. It's generally a great point, but I think he misspeaks when he says objectively realizing their life isn't worth living. First of all, none of us have access to the objective. So your mom. Second, objective just means within the tools and then like I'm, he's going to correct himself, but I assumed he meant just within the tools that they had accessible, meaning with the data they had accessible. Right. Because like no one has access to the objective in that way. Um, objectively realizing life isn't worth living. They're subjectively determining their life isn't worth living and they're, and they're only a few decisions away from feeling otherwise. Maybe. Otherwise, and this person is kind of saying, okay, like, what do you mean by objectively realizing? What do you mean? Uh, these are great. I would love to know more about what qualifies as not worth living. I'm not sure I get enforcing your client's suicidal tendencies as best medical or ethical practice. I agree, which is why I don't do it. Yeah. Right? So I it's not like you're enforcing it. You're, you're acknowledging it. Like my first therapist, you guys know the story. I had one therapist who, when I told her I was suicidal, freaked out and was like, you need to be on medication or I'm never seeing you again. And I was like, what? Like, I already told you I'm open to meds, but I want to have at least 10 sessions with you first. And she was like, 
nope, I'm not dealing with this. And like, it was like the weirdest, like, I was like, what? You're fired, bitch. Like, I'm going to find a better therapist. The next therapist I found was the right therapist. She was like, oh, I get it. Because she saw the logic of where I was at. And I don't care how many of y'all want to say it. Life is hard. It might not be hard enough for you to want to do things, but it was hard enough for me. And so I was in a situation where I was like, I am at my wit's end. I need help, but I am not going to be treated inhumanely or without dignity. And I will fucking sue you if you try. But also I want to get help and I'm ready. So when I went to my second therapist, she worked with me. She validated me and then she worked with me. She wasn't afraid. She had no fear. She was very stable. She was very like matter of fact about everything, which I appreciated because she was very logical. She was just so logical. Oops, I hit my flowers. She was so logical that it 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 made my emotions like stable because she wasn't giving me fear. She wasn't like, like I was literally working three jobs to pay the fucking bill. You know how expensive therapy is? Like we were literally all like the way I was hustling to get shit going. Don't worry, I put most of that shit on a credit card. Oh, my flowers are falling. But anyways, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, my first therapist, like I fired the fuck out of her. She she seemed like she was there for a paycheck. She seemed uninterested in people. My second therapist, she was obviously similar to Dr. K. She really wanted to know me. She felt like people, like her patients. She felt really curious about how my brain worked, which is why I think she helped me tremendously. And we, she just changed my whole life, you know? But of course, she was only the mental health part about being a whole human being. I had to work on my finances, my physical health, my spiritual health, which is philosophy. And then of course, my mental health. And then of course, I had to know who I was in the story, you know? Let me be very clear. I am 100% against suicide. And people may even say like, okay, but what about the situations where someone has a like debilitating medical degenerative? I also think if you want to commit suicide because you feel like there's no other option, but you want to secretly still live, there's always a way to still live. I feel like if you're ready just to end your life, you have a chronic issue or you're just at that age or it's just your time. I think you have the right to choose how you want to die, right? Like I'm pro assisted ending of life if that's what you want to do. I think it should be done humanely and with dignity. But if you feel like you are suicidal, I definitely think that's a cry for help. And, and there's a way out of that. But there's only a way out of that when you're ready to be out of it. And you're not going to be ready to be out of it until you're having like a real introspective trans transformational moment with yourself, with yourself to need to get out of it. And that's a journey that's going to be specific to every person. Sort of illness like ALS. And like, even in those cases, at best, I'm a question mark. So if I had a patient who walked into my office tomorrow and said, hey, I have ALS, I want to kill myself. I would be like, yeah, I can't help you do that. So I've had those kinds of requests, by the way. So I've had patients like the weirdest referral I've ever gotten okay. is someone was like, hey, I need a psychiatrist to sign off so that I can go commit medical suicide in Europe. Oh. And I was like, I'm not willing to do that. So I'm 100% okay. against suicide, okay? I've even had people who mm. will be like, like, but hey, Dr. K, you believe in, in reincarnation, right? So doesn't it make it okay because I just, I just get a redo? And I'm like, no, bro, I'm still against suicide. Sorry, bro. Mm. But here's how I approach uh, I don't believe in reincarnation and I, and I do believe in medical suicide or medical chosen death. I don't like calling it suicide. I think suicide should be specified for like a, a mental health or like a crisis moment. And then chosen death should be a, re a reference to people who are just ready. They're ready, you know? approach those situations. So I think somewhere along the way, and this is like, it's Twitter or X or whatever, right? So acknowledging that someone objectively has a shitty life, and this is, I'll tell you like literally what I say, and here's the way I think I choose to approach it. So far, my patients seem to be pretty happy with it, as far as I know, right? And that is like, okay, so if your life is objective shit and you have no hope, this is what I say. I say, I can explain to me why, first of all, help me understand how your life is meaningless and is complete crap. Like I would love to hear what you're actually talking about. And that's when they say these- The why, right? He's asking about the why kinds of things. And this is when I say, I hear you. I still don't think suicide is the right answer. If you're feeling dangerous and you're going to hurt yourself, please let me know. I'm going to do everything I can in my power to stop that. Mm -hmm. And here is why. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, hundreds of people I've worked with who have been suicidal, hundred people have walked through the door just like you have. Mm -hmm. And 97 out of hundred over time have been arguably as hopeless as you have. And their lives have been better, have gotten better. I hear you that your life is objective shit. Let me help you build a life that is worth living. Now, this is very important to understand. This is not me saying, hey, your brain is malfunctioning. You just don't realize that your life is worth living. This is me saying, hey, I'm going to meet you where you're at. If you think your life sucks, let's do something about it. Right. And this is where like, I don't, I mean, I, in a sense, I can't blame these people. Right. Because there wasn't context to this clip, this 50 second clip. Right. So I absolutely try to correct or improve their situation. But this also has, um, you know, like I, I don't enforce it I, quite the opposite.
I'm not sure I get enforcing your client's suicidal tendencies is best medical or ethical practice. People are so dumb. They're so dumb. Like, that's what I'm saying. How dare the world claim it gives a fuck about you when they're too fucking dumb to see how they're contributing to the fact that, like, you don't think life is worth living because you have to deal with idiots like this every fucking day. You have to deal with these fucking idiots every single day, bro. Who can't even understand the context of a, a clip that is going to help so many other people that are suicidal in this particular category. You're so fucking dumb. And I love that about you, but Jesus, like the road to hell is paved in good intentions. The other thing that I'll kind of say to them is, hey, like, look, I understand that you have no hope right now. What I would love to do is carry the hope for both of us. I have hope for you. you you're telling me that your life is absolute crap right now. People are just so arrogant, bro. They're so arrogant. I hear that. Not just right now. You told me that it's been absolute crap for the last 10 years. I think it's completely reasonable for you to be hopeless. I can't imagine living 10 years of your life and waking up and finding hope. I can't imagine how logically I would be able to do that. I totally get where you're coming from. But I have hope for you. And if you're okay with it, I will carry the hope for you and me for three months. You don't have to. All I want you to do is show up, try and get some help. Mm. Like, I know you've tried a ton. I know you've worked really, really hard. I can see. And by the way, like I said, some people still won't be able to do it. Some people will still choose to die. Some people might feel forced to die. Some people might not be able to do the work. We're humans. We're animals on a planet. We're doing the best with what we can. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? That you've tried so many different things. I don't think you're at fault. But what I would like to do is help you. Because I think the biggest problem in your life is that you haven't received the help that you needed. It's not your fault. You've tried. You've given it a shot. So let me help. And the reason that I choose to hope is because 97 out of 100 people who walk into my office get better. Right. So here's where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. And I'm not willing to give up on you yet. And then some of them will say, but what about the three? You said 97. What if I'm in one of the three? And this is where we get to the cognitive bias. Someone's going to be the person who doesn't. Somebody has to be that part of the population, guys. Oh, that's so interesting. Why would you assume that you would fall into the three instead of the 97? Huh. How did your mind jump there? Mm. That's so interesting. I wonder if there are other situations in your life where you assume that your things are not going to work out for you. Where did you learn that? How did you discover that if, you know, it's fuck. I don't even know what the right analogy is. It's like, you know, if everyone is mining up gold, you dig in the earth and you're the one guy who finds shit. That's an interesting, like, that's an interesting perspective. Help me understand that. And then we'll eventually get to the question of if you believe that you are in the 3% who you, who will fail, what do you think that does for your prospects of success? There's this thing called the nocebo. No, Marina says, who's arrogant? Not Dr. K, the people who are mad at Dr. K, who think they're helping suicidal people by saying Dr. K is, by misunderstanding Dr. K. The arrogant people are the people who are shitting on Dr. K for helping suicidal people in a way they need the category of men he's working with versus they think they're helping suicidal people by like literally misunderstanding this category of suicidal people. Dr. K is not the arrogant one. I'm saying the tweets are the arrogant one. Effect. Where if you believe you're going to screw up, if you go into a job interview and you think you're going to screw it up, the belief that you are going to screw it up increases your chances of screwing it up. And then we get to self-perpetuating cycles and we can open the door and that's when the therapy happens. Why do you immediately jump to the three? And even then, when they say the three, and this is where I say, yeah, like, it's not that those people are uncurable. Let's understand this, right? Let's be nuanced. Let's be specific. It doesn't mean that they can't be helped. It mm. just means that my dumb ass was not sufficient to help them. <laughs> because I also think some people can't be helped. Some people don't want to be helped. I do think some people don't want to be helped. It just makes sense that there would be some part of the population that wouldn't want to be helped, right? Or maybe they haven't found the right tools, but like, what are you going to do? Shockingly, I'm just a regular psychiatrist right? I'm no miracle worker. I am flawed. I can't help all of my patients right. because as a psychiatrist, we don't have all this shit figured out. And right. on some days I don't get eight hours of sleep and maybe my neurons are not. It's amazing how we like, it is amazing sort of, no, that's a different tangent. Never mind. I'm cutting myself off. Wiring. That doesn't mean that they are hopeless. Why do you assume that that means they are hopeless instead of I am flawed? So even for those three patients who I care about deeply, I just recognize I was not the person to help them. So 100% against suicide. Absolutely. And we have to be super careful because if we assume that the reason that people are suicidal is because they are mentally ill, as opposed to they are not mentally ill and there are actually things in their life that are driving them towards suicide, what that means is we will focus on treating something that may not be the problem. So this is something I've learned as a doctor. Miss because the people in their life also don't, wanna, don't want to admit that they're contributing to how people feel about their own life. Family members, loved ones, husbands, wives, they aren't the reason you kill yourself, but they could be contributing to the environmental factor of feeling a way about your life, especially if you're externally motivated like that. You know what I mean?
or impacted in a particular way. Certain environments are less good for me than others because some environments are very like toxic, right? And so obviously if you're in a really, really toxic situation, you could desire unaliving yourself. And so I think there's something that plays into that as well. So fix your environment, fix your internal and fix your relationship with the internal external, right? This diagnosis is the biggest mistake you can make. I think I'm fixing thing A and the problem is B. And right now- Wait, did he say misdiagnosis? What? Eating something that may not be the problem. So this is something I've learned as a doctor. Misdiagnosis is the biggest mistake you can make. This is what I'm saying. This is why I trust Dr. K. Because misdiagnosis is the biggest, pro it's a huge problem. That's why I want to be very clear and that's why I won't self-diagnose myself in a real way. Like something that requires me to change my behavior because if I misdiagnose myself, like because I'm self-diagnosing, then I'm going to end up like probably doing more harm than good to myself. Me personally, I don't want to speak for you. I'm speaking for myself. So I am very cautious about self-diagnosis myself or even when a therapist diagnoses me, I want to make sure that it makes sense. Like when I see it, I'm like, okay, this is helping me and I'm excited about this. Like when I was diagnosed with borderline BPD, uh, people would tell me like, there's no way you have borderline. I don't, I don't see that in you. There's no way she misdiagnosed you. And I was like, even if she did, the therapy is really helping. So I actually think the diagnosis was appropriate, but also the therapy and it totally changed my life. My, the therapy completely changed my life. The DBT changed my life. So for me at the time, it didn't even matter if it was a misdiagnosis, but I, to this day, I'm, I'm, I think it's a really appropriate diagnosis myself. I think I'm fixing thing A and the problem is B. And right now what we're seeing is a large increase in suicidal tendencies in men for sure, but also in women. Like proper, true 21st century equality people, we are seeing equalization of mental illness, which is not a good thing. It's a bad thing because everything is going up. So now let's take a look at another reaction. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like a fulfillment issue. Yeah, it sounds like, like if, you're, if you're in it. <laughs> We know her. Oh, I know her. Area. So like, for instance, I believe that people can get to a point where their life is not worth living. But in order for you to think that your life is not worth living, I think you have to have like some kind of mental illness going on. Uh, except for, like I said, in some circumstances, like if you've got extreme failing health, um, such that you're just like in pain all the time. Like I, like I said, there's some exceptions that, that I can understand, but for the most part, I don't think. I think it means life's not worth living is a conclusion people arrive at after a lot of thought rather than a malfunction brain. I disagree. I don't think that's the case. You're, something is fucked in your brain then because there's not, there's just not, Humans. This is why I feel like Destiny and I completely did not understand each other. He did not see me and which is why he probably burned the bridge with me ultimately because like that is not my lived experience. So every time we talked about mental health or anything, even my weed, he even judged how much I smoked weed. And I was like, we're having a completely different relationship with life. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? And so like, like no hate to him, but we have like a principal difference in how we view reality. We have like a very specific relationship with life. And obviously my life is like, I have proof that I've turned my life around in the healthiest way. So it is kind of interesting. You know what I mean? And so I do wonder, I think, well, let's see what Dr. K says. Acclimate. A healthy brain acclimates to an unbelievable amount of stuff. Like even, I've said this before, I think it was yesterday, even people who are like handicapped, like you can lose both your legs, even quadriplegic, you can have shut in or locked in syndrome. And even these people's happiness will acclimate surprisingly quickly. Um, so the idea that you've done some rational analysis of your life, and like, wow, I need to kill myself. Something is, yeah, something is not. Okay. So I'm, I'm sure at some point, Destin and I, or I, I hope, will actually have a conversation about this. Because this fun fucking reacting back and forth is, so uh, look, so I, I respect Destin a lot. I think he's not wrong here and I disagree. So let's understand a couple of things, right? So let's turn to the data. So this is where like, I'm not, and there, there's data to the opposite of what I'm saying. So we're going to talk about the flaws in the data. So the first idea is that, okay, like people can have a life that's crappy, but if you're suicidal, there's one exception, which is like debilitating illness. Um, and Destiny's also correct that there are a lot of studies that show that human beings acclimatize to like lower standards. That's true. Like if you lose a limb, you will, and you ask someone, would you rather lose your, both your hands or die? People will say, I would rather lose both. I would rather die than lose both of my hands. But then if someone has an accident where they lose. Dude, I would be so hot on OnlyFans with only, with only legs. I'd be so hot. Oh my God. I would fucking milk the OnlyFans. If I had no arms, you know there's a market for that shit. Both of their hands, heaven forbid. Then what you discover is they're like, are you glad you're alive? They're like, yeah, I discovered that I can still have fun. I think there are a couple of huge disconnections here with some of the things that Destiny's saying. Based on my understanding as a clinician, I don't blame the guy because you know he's not a doctor, which doesn't mean that he can't have valid viewpoints. He's right. actually exceptional at assimilating information without a professional background. I think it's something I respect about him a lot. He's right about some of this stuff. And also let's look at some more data. I think he's wrong about some of it too, but okay. So um, this is a study called Suicide in the Absence of Mental Disorder, a review of psychological autopsy studies across countries. Okay. So 
We conducted a systematic review of, uh, uh, what is PA? Psychological autopsy studies from 2000 onwards, okay? Up to 66.7% of suicide cases remain without diagnosis in those that only examine access one disorders. Up to 66.7% of suicide cases remained without diagnosis in those studies that only examine access one. Okay. So 14 studies looked at access one disorders, which means more acute mental illness, not personality disorders, and 66.7% of cases remained without a diagnosis. Approximately 37.1% of suicide cases had no psychiatric condition in research papers that assess personality and access one. So if we start looking at personality disorders like narcissism or sociopathy or things like that, borderline personality disorder, then the number of undiagnosed people drops to 37%. Okay. And then... Uh, Stephen does a great job of this. He says later on, we're not, I don't know exactly what he says, but he says like, I believe that there are going to be studies which will show no evidence of mental illness, but I think that is a case of undiagnosed mental illness that is really there and causing them to malfunction, okay? So it's like, when we look at this study, does this mean that this person was not mentally ill or that Maybe. they were mentally ill and we just didn't pick it up, okay? So let's just look at another paper. So I think when I was talking about the, 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 the actual study I was referencing was this one. Um, uh, so this is from the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. I think this is a group out of UCLA or is like the primary authors here. Okay, so these are like real research articles. Okay, most male suicide descendants, uh, decedents had no known mental health conditions. Most. Okay. Um, and more frequently, those without uh, known mental health conditions died by firearm and many tested positive for alcohol. Adolescents, young uh, adult males and middle-aged males without known mental health conditions more often had relationship problems, arguments, mm -hmm. and or a crisis is a precipitating circumstance than those with known mental health conditions. So this is really important to understand mm -hmm. because what this study suggests is that it's not just that we're missing stuff. It is that we can look at these cases. And what we can find is that prior to suicide, these people had relationship problems, arguments, and or some kind of crisis in their life. Mm. Okay? Um, now I'm going to show you all a paper that uh, counters this. Um, I wonder if it's also going to correlate with a high propensity for like um, homelessness and self-harm amongst people who are neurodivergent. And I wonder how much that's going to play a role in this, especially amongst men, and especially since men have a harder time admitting they need help, generally speaking, and admitting they need to go to go seek that help. I mean, even Destiny, when he talked to Dr. K last time, said he struggled with even taking medication because he thought it like correlated to, I think he said weakness. I could be wrong on that. But some sort of judgment towards the self, I think, growing up conservative. So even Stephen runs into that problem as well. So, you know, and he's considered pretty liberal, you know, for a man and pretty open minded for a man, you know. So if he's struggling, what do you think the average conservative is doing when it comes to their own mental health? So there could be a possibility of an undiagnosed person. But again, is that a, a dilemma in the brain or is that processing reality? If you were in the Holocaust, would it be within reason to kill yourself before the Nazis did? You know, and if not, why not? If you're in a situation where you're born in a war torn country, if you're in the Congo right now, hell, if you're in Palestine right now, is that an environment in which it's justified to say this is too much and I'm over it? Or no, is that even insane to say that I would want to take myself out of this horrible situation? What if you've been kidnapped and you feel like you're never going to get out? Is it better to kill yourself or to live with your kidnapper in hopes that one day you'll be free? What is the rational thing and what is the mental illness? I mean, obviously, if the circumstances were different, none of us would ever want to kill ourselves because we'd be living our lives chilling. Or maybe we would still would want to kill ourselves because we're done living. We act like living is the goal, but living well seems to be the goal. I don't think humans are, are satisfied with just living for all humans, right? I think for a lot of people, they need to live well or live specifically, you know? So again, having that meaning crisis figured out, check out John Verveke. So again, when we're talking about what is the motivator, it's going to be very specific to the category you fall into. I always said, like, I never wanted to kill myself. I just wanted to get away from the people that made me want to die because they were exhausting. I think the world is exhausting and I want you to stop talking to me because literally you sit here and you tell me you want to help by trapping people, suffocating people, kidnapping people, throwing people in facilities. You say you want to help the world and you're like discriminating against people because they're neurodivergent or because they're black. You're telling me you want to help the world while you're sitting there justifying the bombings of Palestinian children because what? You think you have the right to a part of the planet? And maybe you do as an animal species, but I'm exhausted by all of you. So again, I don't want to die. So stay out of my life because like, hello, it's also a neurodivergent thing as well to like not want to be told almost like what to do you know, in a sense. And what's more telling people what to do than telling them that you have to live? The irony is like forcing people to want to live almost triggers something in people's brains where it's like, don't tell me to live my life, bitch. You're not my mom. And even my mom can't tell me how to live my life. Don't tell me how to live my life. Listen to everybody always trying to tell people how to live their lives. 
Shut the fuck up. Sort of, okay? So. Uh, also, I recommend you choose healthiness over unhealthiness. But if you want to be unhealthy, like, keep doing you because I'm going to make content out of your life. Thank you. Um, Let me see if. Okay. So this is a paper on the epidemiology of suicide and from a psychiatric perspective. I think this this really looks at a lot of World Health Organization data. Cognitive dissonance says, do men think they need to be strong and stoic or has life taught them that their feelings are not valid or taken seriously or even mocked when shared with men or women? Men set the precedent. Men decided, right? Men decided how men would judge other men and they convinced women to judge men based off those standards. Women also want men that other men think are manly. In the same way, men want women that other men would want to fuck. So, and this is a generalization of a certain type of person, obviously, like a person who really cares about being a man. A man who doesn't care about being a man isn't going to suffer from these problems because they're going to fight these problems and come out the other side. But if you're a man who cares about being, quote, a real man, then you've set the precedent by your ancestors. Men have set this precedent of expecting a man to act a certain way and shaming women for choosing. Men are the first ones to shame me for dating men that aren't as manly. Men are the loudest people who are like, why'd you choose that guy? He's not even as manly as me. And I'm like, what? What? What are you talking about? So again, like people only shame because their own little bubble tells them that's how it works. But in a bubble where like nobody cares about gender, the only way to be a good man is just to be a good person. There is no man or woman, right? There is no man or woman. There's only being a good person. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. The majority of suicides worldwide are related to psychiatric diseases. Okay, so here is another paper that was published in 2018, which concludes that across the globe, like most of these things seem to be related to psychiatric illness. So we have some papers saying, okay, this is very little, like two thirds are not psychiatrically ill. We have some papers that say the majority are not psychiatrically ill and they have relationship problems. And then we have some papers saying that, okay, like suicide, like mental illness is a huge risk factor for suicide and maybe associated with suicide. All that stuff is, is fair, right? So how do we interpret this stuff? Okay, first of all, okay, Cognitive dissonance says, isn't that victim blaming if you say it's men's fault that they can't share their feelings? We're talking about a social phenomenon. We're not talking about any kind of man. If we were talking about individual men, I can validate your feelings, but you still have to do something about it. I don't believe in shame. Shame comes from the external world. If you don't agree with the external world, like why are you feeling shame, right? So we're talking about a phenomenon and why things happening. And why things happen, right? So I'm not victim blaming. I'm just saying don't cry over spilled milk and don't cry over a cake you made yourself. You know what I mean? Like get over it. But also like feel your feelings but it doesn't mean other people have to validate them either. You know what I mean? I just feel like that's a weird way to take what I said. I think that's weird. Also, you guys arguing if redacted is like a slur or not is so funny to me. Words are constructs. None of them mean anything. They only mean what they mean to communicate. So if you take it offensively, that's how your brain is processing information. If you mean them offensively, that's how you're using the words. If you don't mean them offensively and you're trying to be funny or quirky or use words in a way that's like <laughs> funny, they're just words. They don't mean anything. They only mean something if you've put and like if they mean something. So. So this is where we've got to be super careful. So I want you all to really understand the way that we interpret these. And I think Dustin did a great job of kind of analyzing this, right? So when we look at a scientific paper and we say, okay, the evidence suggests we do not see any history of mental illness in somewhere between 37 and 66% of people who commit suicide, men who commit suicide. Now we have to be super careful because what a lot of people will default to is say, okay, this is undiagnosed mental illness, but that's not actually what the data shows. Right? So this is where we, we can say like, okay, I believe that fairies are responsible for curing cancer. And then I look at a study that shows there's no evidence of fairies in 66% of cases. And then I say, well, I think that fairies are interested are, 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 are an important part of curing cancer. And in those 66% of studies, we just didn't detect the fairies. So we have to be super careful there because what we're actually doing is we are taking a piece of data and we are interpreting it based on our belief system, as opposed to looking what the actual data says. The actual data says there's no evidence of mental illness in somewhere between 37 and 66% of people. Now to counter that point, just like Destiny points out, we know that the rates of mental illness are undiagnosed, or there are high rates of undiagnosed mental illness. We don't really know what those are, but whatever our estimates of mental illness are, they're certainly worse. So there's a very good argument to make that these people are mentally ill. On balance, 
I do not think that the rates of mental illness, mis like undiagnosed mental illness, are super, super high. I tried to find s statistics on it. The numbers are somewhere between 40 and 100%, which means that if we're diagnosing 20% of people with depression, what that means is that the real number is somewhere between 30 and 40%. It's not like we're mis mis we're not missing like, you know, nine out of 10 people. We're missing maybe one out of two. And that's sort of a generous mm -hmm. estimate. So even if we assume that we're missing one out of two and we double the rates of, of detection, right? We're still like talking about a large chunk of the population, somewhere between 20 and 40% of the population that doesn't have a mental illness that's committing suicide. And the other reason that I believe that is because of studies like this where I, I kind of show you, showed you all that if we look at this, like if we look at suicide, we can see that there are other precipitating factors that aren't mental illness, which is why people kill themselves. We, we, there's data around this, right? So it's not just, so I think it's a, here's kind of where I am with this. It is a valid, it, it is a shocking statistic that in the, the most alarming studies, 66.7% of people who kill themselves do not have mental illness. That mm. is an alarming statistic. I don't mm. think that the number is actually that high. I think that we're missing a fair amount of mental yeah. illness, for sure. No question. Mm -hmm. Now, how much? I don't know. Mm. Now we I get agree. to a core problem, which is that this is not just like Dr. K saying this, right? So this is also where I should say that my clinical experience about this has been scary because I, I've worked with these people who I don't think are mentally ill. They just look at their life and they're like, I can't do this anymore. This is not a sustainable way to live life. And then you may say, then why not change it? Because they've tried and failed. They're not willing to make the change. They're unable to make the change. They're powerless to make the change. This is why you, you, you believe that you're going to check out, right? And that's where I think we need to help them, which is what I do in my job. Mm. But we've got to be super careful going back to this basic issue, okay? So when someone comes in and says, my life is shit, what are we saying, right? What's the right move? Do we say to this person, this person comes in and I have suicidal ideation. Do we assume when women say they're suicidal and their life is shit, they go, but you're so pretty. Bitch. Okay. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> that 1% of people are malfunction of the mind. Or do we say, <sighs> okay, like we're going to not be paternalistic therapists. We are going to listen to you. We are going to acknowledge that you know your life better than we do. And if someone shows up and says all lives have value, like I think that's great. Like, I think it's great that you believe that. Now what I want you to do is if you're someone who believes this and what would it take for you? What would you have to go through to change this belief? What would your experience of life have to be? How bad would your life have to be to change your mind that every man has a life worth living? What kind of shit would you have to go through to throw you off of that? And now what we really need to understand is that this is the experience of people. I feel like I don't think every man has a life worth living. I think it's a really weird that's like a lie. That's like a cope, right? Every man has a life worth living. I feel like that's a cope. But I think we're animals on a planet, so that's probably a part of it. I think I think everybody is energy on a planet because that's what has been shown through the data and through observation. And I think we all – I don't think we have an inherent meaning – and I don't think we have inherent worth outside of environment. I actually think in terms of nature, we have worth, but not in terms of society. I think when people say every man has a life worth living, they keep thinking of society. I think our inherent worth at most comes from nature itself. Like a tree has inherent worth, as does a human, because of their energy impact on the planet. Right? So there is inherent worth in your life because your energy for the planet your energy for the ecosystem. But I don't think that means you have a life worth living. Right? Like, that's an interesting belief to have. Kay says no one has a life worth, in quotations, living. You just have a life. Yeah. That's an interesting, like, way to perceive life. Every man has a life worth living. Yeah. Interesting. Sounds a little copy to me. People who are suicidal. Hmm. Instead of assuming that they're weak or broken, let's assume for Conrad, there is no such thing as an objective slur. You're just wrong. Come on. How long have you been watching my content? You said it's not a bubble thing. What do you think language is? It's objectively a slur and to deny it is stupid. It can't be a slur. Saying that's gay in a negative way is bad to gay people. It's not a matter of bubbles. That's what a bubble is. Right? But like it can't be a slur, Conrad. Or like it can't be objective. If you go to another place on the globe, it's not it's not even objective would mean out be me, meaning outside of time, space and in and 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 perception. We made the word up. It's a construct. Of course it's not objective. You mean objective as in like all of us have agreed that that's what we're doing. But that's like not what we're doing. That's why it can't 
Kay is saying objective like outside of perception and you're saying objective because we've decided it is. You're using the word objective completely differently. So in a bubble in which objective means the majority agrees, Conrad is right, retarded is a slur. If you're saying objective, meaning outside of the construct, then no, of course it can't be a slur. There's no such thing as a slur. Slurs are constructs created by humans. Slurs are not objective. They're just words that the bubbles have decided we don't like them. But they don't mean anything unless we decide they mean something. They can't be objective. For a moment, that their lives are objectively incredibly hard. That their lives are nothing like the lives that we live. <clears throat> Because this is what I've seen, and I'm not the only one. So, there's another just these emails that I wrote to my friends a couple years ago. And I um, uh, excuse me, we know her. Just kidding, we know him. I remember. I, I, is this young Abba? How long ago is this, bro? I showed them to one of my uh, one of my colleagues, and I was mm. like, you know, I, I was thinking about talking about some of this stuff publicly, and and I was like, you know, but I, I'm not ready to yet because I'm pretty sure I'm going to lose my job, you know, at Harvard. Mm. an academic position and he was like oh no, no no if you talk about this you're not going to just lose your academic position you're going to lose all of your positions <laughs> 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 and so i was like oh okay interesting so yeah gotta make strategic know. moves um i know so abba atlas also is an awesome content creator we talked we had a conversation on men's issues like years ago and like that's what the climate was back then and thankfully i think the climate is better now like so you know it, it's challenging stuff and i think this is the reason right so the moment that you start saying stuff like this people will start interpreting all kinds of weird things and not weird things i think they're reasonable but it's like you know, so so this is this is where let's understand like the dialogue here because this is important. It's not that if I acknowledge that my client or patient has a life that is not worth living, that doesn't mean I tell them to go kill themselves. In fact, quite the opposite. I'm just going to say this again. It's to say, hey, bro, I understand that you have a life that you think is not worth living. I would like to help you deal with these. Conrad, you're doing the same thing these people are doing to suicide people. You're saying it always has an impact. It does not have an impact. It only has an impact if it's perceived to have an impact. You can, don't you understand? Like, it can only have an impact if it's perceived to have an impact. And it could have a positive or negative. Of course it has an impact, but probably a positive one versus a negative one. You're saying it has a negative one, unless you're saying it has a neutral impact, then we all agree. Slurs, you see even saying a slur is putting a connotation on it as if it's you're saying it's bad. It's just a word. So the word can only have the impact that is being perceived by the audience or by the person using word. You're doing the same thing that people are doing to Dr. K right now. Dr. K's words mean this, and he can't believe he said it. But Dr. K didn't mean it in that context. He didn't even mean it in that way. You misunderstood. But also, you are the one having the relationship with the word. And you're having a negative one with it. But not everyone's having that universal relationship with words. You're putting your lived experience on other people. And you're saying, you have to be like me. And I'm saying, no. Nine. No. Canceled. Objective problems. Man, I'm going to get clipped. It looked like I was doing Hail Hitler. I was saying, <laughs> nine. no. <laughs> Instead of just assuming that you're, you have a bunch of cognitive bias, which is making you misunderstand what's going on, what I would like to help you do is find a romantic relationship, build a career, you know, get... Uh, Build a body that you are not embarrassed about, right? These are the actual goals. And in order to accomplish these three things, in my experience as a clinician, that's when we get to this. Because this stuff interferes with this in a way that they don't understand, right? And this word, am I being paternalistic? No, I mean, I think there's actually like a skill set of things that people who are in this situation have never had the benefit of learning. And due to issues like trauma and stuff like that, they have so many like... They have so many things going against them that they just have no ability to start because that's not how... I mean, human beings don't really pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Almost never. Sometimes it happens. But generally speaking, what we know is like humans who are successful are successful because they get other humans to help them. And at the beginning of the... At the top of the list is like parenting. Healthy parenting... Exactly. Thing ...is such a huge advantage in life. And what is healthy parenting? Healthy parenting is help. The most important help that you will ever receive in your life is from your parents. And if you did not get that help, you have such a disadvantage. But that doesn't mean that the problem is in your head. That means that you may actually have a life that is quite crappy. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you should kill yourself. It just means we need to do a better job of helping you. So let's look at some other papers. Yes, but I do still think a part of the population will need to help themselves in a way that no matter how many resources they get, they won't help themselves ones or maybe even two sometimes.
people just aren't introspective enough to take the help they're given. Okay. Uh, Conrad, nobody said that. So you want to foolishly believe it has no impact? It only has the impact it has. It could be no impact, some impact, neutral impact. Right? Like, all things only have the impact they have. Um, this one we'll skip for now. So, so this is kind of interesting. So a couple years ago, we had someone come up with this concept of diseases of despair. So what we did is we looked at, let me see if this is the paper. No, we'll get to this. Let me find this. I want to find the one with the diagram. Do you have the diagram? No, you don't have the diagram. Do you have the diagram? Ooh. Where's the diagram? Diagram, looking this for way. a diagram. So hmm. we started to realize something. We saw some disturbing trends, okay? So, for example, deaths from diseases of despair in Britain comparing suicide, alcohol-related, and drug-related mortality for birth cohorts in Scotland, England, Wales, and selected cities. So a couple of people noticed something, and they noticed something kind of scary. Okay, so I'll show you. So this is a, a trend in the diagnosis of diseases of despair in the United States between 2009 and 2018. Y'all ready? Ready to get wrecked? We'll talk about what diseases of despair are. 515,830 participants received a despair diagnosis, 58% me male, median 36 years. From 2009 to 2018, the prevalence of alcohol-related, substance-related, and suicide-related diagnoses respectively increased by 37%, 94%, and 170%. Ages 55 to 74 had the largest increase in alcohol, substance-related diagnoses. Hey, let's try to be a little bit kinder to the boomers. Can we do that, please? Can we? I know some of them are not nice to us, but can we please be kind to the boomers? And here's, here's y'all ready? Y'all ready? Internet generation, ready. Gen Alpha, Gen Z, ages less than 18 had the overall, had the largest increase in suicide-related diagnoses, 287%. Whoa! Ages less than 18 had the largest increase in suicide-related diagnoses, 287%, bro. The odds ratio for men is 1.49, which means that one and a half times li is likely, or 50% more likely. Okay? And then there's some stuff about the Affordable Care Act. So, like, this is scary, right? And this is, by the way, is related to diagnosis. This is not talking about, this is not a study looking at people who kill themselves who don't have a diagnosis. But what does this mean? Diseases of despair. So here's the other, like, crazy thing. Which, if you look at this research, like, here's what you begin to see. We're going to talk about addiction and suicide for a hot second. Mm -hmm. So, in my experience, there are two roots. Mm. I feel like if you're on substances and you die, I'm not sure that I always consider it, like, suicide or even count it. I think you, like, I do take into consideration a lot of, uh, if there's drugs or alcohol involved, if there's a substance involved when you kill yourself... A part of me doesn't know if you made the decision before, so you took the substance to kill yourself, or if the substance interacting with your body caused you to accidentally kill yourself, right? So I'm paying attention to that as well. And again, just for my own sake, because like when people in your life die, there's a lot of questions. Why did they kill themselves? Where are they? Was there drugs involved? Do you want to blame everything but the person? But also, I don't believe in blame. I don't think blaming anything helps. I don't, I don't think blame helps. So for me, I try not to blame anything. I just tried to figure out the why. And it's like, so why did you kill yourself? Did you want to die? Were you ready to die? Or were you sick? Did alcohol play a part? You know, all of those things come to my mind personally. To addiction. Number one, you have an addiction. Number two, you are slow playing suicidality. So now it sounds kind of crazy, but let's understand this. See, when you're suicidal, you've given up on life. Life isn't worth living. So what do you do? Right? In the worst cases that we want to try to prevent, you kill yourself. But you don't have to kill yourself fast. The other thing you can do is get an addiction. And as I've worked with more and more people with addiction, what I've started to realize is this is a slow suicide. My life is empty. I have nothing to look forward to. So what am I going to do today? Let me go ahead and fuck the world and fuck my future and fuck everything mm -hmm. around me. I'm gonna That's what I'm saying. We always say we care about people wanting to kill themselves, but you don't realize like how many people are slowly killing themselves. But also, like if you care then you should know why they're trying to kill themselves instead of projecting onto them why they want to kill themselves. You know what I mean? It's kind of why I think Eugenia Cooney has the right to exist in the world because I'm not going to shame her away from existing. I don't think it's wrong for her to exist. I think it's good that she's alive. And if being online and making content creation makes her happy, then I want her to keep doing that, obviously. Like, can you imagine all those people that are like, Eugenia Cooney shouldn't be streaming. She shouldn't be online. Um, but what if getting offline is the reason she kills herself? You know what I mean? Like, do we want her to live or not? I just feel like she's living her own authentic story and her authentic story is having an issue with her body. And I don't know why you're all trying to hide from that. If you're worried about it influencing people, literally start with your fucking religions and shut the fuck up. Like at the end of the day, all of us are influencing each other or not 
But, it, you know, going after Eugenia Cooney is just like so like it's like punching down. It's so weird. You know, it's so weird to go after her. It's just like the weirdest. Leave her alone. You know what I mean? Just let her be her weird self. I'm going to get high. I'm going to jerk off. I'm going to watch porn. I'm going to play video games because life has nothing to offer. So I'm just going to indulge in this dopaminergic spurt. Addiction diagnoses, I think in like, I want to say 30% ballpark. Honestly, the number's probably higher. You know what's interesting? In the conservative bubble, they get like little, they get mini upset. You can see it. They like twitch when you mention the word trauma. They go, they're so sick of it. They feel so overwhelmed. Dr. K is giving us data on Gen Z being diagnosed and all the conservatives will generally generalizing here conservatives will see that and say like oh isn't it interesting that all these new people are getting diagnosed oh isn't it interesting that all these people have issues maybe they don't have issues but then when we say the same conservatives will be like men don't ever get heard nobody wants to listen to men's problems but if men get their problems heard you're gonna get diagnosed or you're gonna get some sort of explanation for your behavior so like you know the numbers are gonna go up if men aren't being heard, if conservatives are correct that men aren't being heard for their problems, but also conservatives are afraid of diagnoses going up, what do you think happens after men share their feelings? Diagnoses go up because you're probably dealing with something for real, bro, and you should get some help. But if you're afraid of contributing to the statistic of it going up, you might deny yourself the help because now you're part of that group of people that has the diagnosis and you're part of the contribution to the number going up. Again, my belief system shifted so heavily on this. I'm no longer worried as long as it is true. I have no fear. The truth will set me free. Whatever is true will bring me closer to my joy. It doesn't matter. But if you're worried about statistics, if you're worried about how it looks, if you're worried about your bubble judging you, of course you're going to run yourself into a wall, bro. Of course you're going to run yourself into a gun. Of course you're going to run yourself into like denying your own feelings. Either we aren't going to care so we can help people or we are going to care so we're not going to be able to help people. You're so worried about everyone getting diagnosed that you're not allowing people to seek out the help they need. They, it's just, oh, I love humans. I love humans. These people have given up on life and they're just extracting whatever they can from this biological sack while they're alive. Honestly, that's been my experience. And this is what the diseases of despair tell us. So a group of clinicians realize something really interesting, which is that there's a group of people who seem to be despairing in life. These are people who, it's not quite depression. So this is not like a neurochemistry imbalance in the brain that is triggering all this. There are groups of people. So if you look at research in the UK, fishing villages in the UK are notorious for this. The economy sucks. These are oftentimes young men who are given these attitudes of independence and being like, what makes a good man? A good man provides. And when the economic situation that you live in allows you to no longer provide, you can no longer be a good man. And what do you do? You turn to alcohol and other kinds of things. That's why they look at, if you look at the, the diseases of despair, there's a reason why they look at these particular diagnoses. They're not looking at like generalized anxiety disorder or OCD. There is a See, the same bubbles that also adhere very strong to gender roles and gender expectation also, I think, create a lot of mental health problems or slash depression problems or slash suicidality. Because again, like in my bubble, there's no such thing as a good man or a good woman. There's only a good person. And good people come in all shapes and sizes and forms. So if you're obsessed with like, am I a good enough woman? What, what does that even mean? Or am I a good enough man? I was like, why are you putting this pressure on yourself? Like that's the irony. It's, it's like self-inflicted. Like your pressure of being a good man is bubble inflicted and therefore like also self-inflicted. Like you're allowing your bubble to redefine your manhood so you don't feel good enough when that does not need to be the construct in which you live your life. A different kind of construct, which is when people genuinely have a life that is crappy with very little opportunity, we see a certain psychiatric manifestation. Okay. So I'm going to just run through like a sample example of like what this conceptual model of uh, diseases of despair. This is a fantastic article, by the way. So let's look at where this starts. Like, so here's the key thing to understand. Mental health outcomes is at the end. This is the terminal event. This is not the cause. This is the outcome. Ah, uh, yep. 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 Relatable. Yep. 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 I didn't get borderline because I, you know what I mean? I got borderline because of my environment. PTSD because of something that happened to me in an environment. Right? Ah, uh, yep. 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 That's so interesting. Okay. 
So we have proximal life stressors like social rejection, loss of status, economic hardship, loss of purpose, life events, low resource environment, lack of stable employment, social network. This is the actual start. Protestant work ethic, I guess, is associated with it. Self-reliance and independence, masculine culture. Oh, fuck me. You're telling me that on the flowchart of mental illness is masculine culture and societal expectations? Fuck me. Historical event. But people aren't going to believe that because the data feels wrong. That doesn't, that doesn't feel, and look, the data isn't like, it's just explaining what's happening now. It's just the data we have now. Data can change. Other people have insight. Other bubbles have intuitive like insight. There's so many other things, right, going into this. Events, childhood adversity, economic challenges, suicide contagion in media. And then we get to the person. This is stuff that is completely outside of our control. Thoughts. No one cares about me or will help me. The system slash others have betrayed me. Nothing will ever get better. I should be able to fix this. Other people don't understand me. I'm broken. I'm helpless. I'm weak. I'm a bad person. Okay? Now, this is where we can say, okay, doesn't this mean that this person is mentally ill? Sadly, I don't know. Sadly, I think the reason that a lot of- Well, it's also reinforced from the environment. Right? Like, I know for myself, I grew up in an environment that meant well, but everything they said was contradictory. Even now- you know, my parents fall into that bubble. I was telling my mom about my fibromyalgia the other day. And she goes, well, what's it from, Batsy? Like, what? why do you even have fibro? And I said, well, there's two theories that's primarily floating around in the medical community from my understanding. is like it's either a undiagnosed autoimmune that we haven't figured out yet, a result from trauma, or some sort of greater illness. And the fibro is kind of like a symptom of that actual illness. So we don't know yet. And she was like, she like twitched when I said trauma. She was, and like, same with those women on the panel with Wick yesterday. It's like, like everyone thinks, oh, like nobody has trauma like this. Nobody like needs to put it in their bio. Like nobody needs to. Look, humans are silly. They believe in gods. They literally worship invisible beings they've never met, which is great. But they can't fathom that life is hard enough to cause some sort of deviation and joy and happiness in a person's lived experience. Ultimately, like if you're trying to problem solve for your life and you're met with a wall and someone who's like, it's not that, it's never that, you're so narcissistic, you're so into yourself, ugh, you're such a victim. It's like sometimes people can be that way, but sometimes you really need help. So knowing who you are in the story is a part of being a whole human being. Are you making excuses for yourself? Are you self-sabotaging? Are you the fake victim who cries wolf because you want attention? Or do you seriously need some fucking help? And then you got to get the help from the right people. Because if you get it from the wrong people, you're going to fuck yourself up even more. The right people will give you the right tools to actually get better. The wrong people, the wrong kind of therapist, the wrong kind of friend, the wrong kind of priest, the wrong kind of anybody will lead you in a direction that hurts you more. Now, what worked for you might not work for others and what works for others might not work for you. But the irony is that people say, you know what I mean? They want to help people, but since they only know one way to help people, they can't fathom there's another way. And all I'm saying is be open-minded enough to realize there are other ways to live. Not everybody works like you. And that maybe is scary to people because they think I'm normal, but I'm the normal one. So ev most people are like me, right? Most people are like whoever they're mostly like. I don't even believe in normal. Like, I'm not even sure what that means. Normal is just like an expectation of behavior, which most people mask and fake anyways. When you really get down to the internal workings of a person, we are all categorizable. I highly doubt there's even a normal though to even rely on when you really get down to the details of a person. Even your community, you know you're putting on a front. You know a lot of people say things but do other things behind closed doors. So I don't even know who the normal is in that society if no one's even acting normally. A lot of people believe this is because they're conditioned to believe this, because they've been taught this in some way. Now, oftentimes they qualify as a mental illness, but like it's really sad, but this is not a malfunction of the brain. This is programming. Is it mental illness because it impairs their function? Absolutely. But when you have a child who's raised in traumatic circumstances, childhood adversity, abuse of parents, this is the way that they see the world. And they're not wrong. Right. This is what happens when you get traumatized. You develop survival mechanisms, which become maladaptive later. We have a whole guide coming out in maybe like a month or two about this. Right? And so then there's emotions. And then we get to some of this stuff, the word of belongingness, perceived burden, burdensomeness, which is really scary, okay? So I want you all to understand these two. We'll go into more detail in a second. So when we look at theories of suicidality, what we find is that there are a couple of really damning things that really lead towards suicidality. 
And mental illness is absolutely a huge risk factor. But what researchers have actually done is they've tunneled down and, and looked at the people. Forget about the diagnosis for a second. What actually happens in this person's life? And what they discover is there are two things. One is perceived burdensomeness, mm. and the second is thwarted belongingness. Mm. Now, what do these mean? This means yes. that, first of all, I'm a burden to those around me. Right? This is perceived burdenness, burdensomeness. It's not clear how, I don't know how you objectively measure burden. But these people go through life or at some point they start to believe that like I'm more of a burden than a help. I don't contribute anything. I'm just a taker. And the other one that's really devastating, which I think we see a lot of now, this, this one I think is getting worse, is thwarted belongingness. This is where people try to belong. I come to a group of people and I say, hey, can I hang out with you? And everyone says, ew, no. Or everyone says, yeah, come and join us. But you still don't fit in. Yeah, be our friend. And you're like, I don't feel seen by this pe by these people. Like Robin Williams said, you know, it really is devastating being feeling alone in a crowd of people. Especially in a crowd of people where people want you there, but they don't want you, the consciousness there. Lindsay says, I was watching Sam Vankinen. He said that victimhood and narcissism are different sides of the same coin. What do you think of Sam? Well, Sam's a narcissist, right? He came out as a narcissist. I don't like Sam's work. I think he's too tra traumatized. He's too Freudian for me. I think he's too negative. But I know some people who really love his work and feel like he's helped them. Um, I'm not attracted to his work. I don't like it. I'm not attracted to people that are very into themselves. Richard, Sam, uh, Romani. Like, I don't like any of their personalities. They're way too narcissistic for me. And, and I think all three of them are narcissists. Romani would say she's not, but she obviously is. This is like, this is where you're like, hey, I'm a human being. I'm trying to connect with y'all. And people are like, thank you, but no, thank you. And in a sense, this is reasonable, right? Because no, I mean, I'll hear this a lot, especially in terms of gender dynamics. And, and everyone's like, I'm not responsible for fixing this other person's problem. It's not my responsibility to be this person's friend. It's not my responsibility to include this person. It is their responsibility to fix themselves, find their own things. I'm not responsible for another human being. This is the, the value system that we live in today, in the mm. West at least. And, and by the way, these are the two things that connect to the meaning crisis. So you don't want to feel like a burden, right? I always say like people are my favorite burdens and you are a burden, bitch. You're so fucking annoying. I love you. But Jesus, as if we're not all burdens, just loving somebody is a type of burden. I just think it's a burden worth having. Life itself is a burden. I just don't think burden, I think burdens are weights you carry in life. I think the way people think about burden is like, I don't know, just like so negative in a way that my brain just doesn't process it. I'm just like, yeah, dude, you inconvenience me. You're worth it. You're worth the inconvenience. Who fucking cares? Sometimes you're not worth it. Sometimes like people aren't worth it and you cut them out of your life. It's just what it is, right? And then the other one is being seen for the consciousness that you are, being actually liked for the person that you are, and then to which, capa to which capacity. So again, I would say, in a philosophy sense, you should know the parts of yourself and try to connect those parts of yourself to other people without needing them to see you fully. You know, I don't need people to see me fully to feel validated or seen by them. But in my past, I thought I did. When I was younger, I thought, how am I ever going to feel like I've been seen if I haven't been seen fully by people. And I realized like, oh, I need to be fully seen by myself and be grateful and enjoy the relationships I can have with people regardless if they can see me fully or not. And my life is a thousand times better. I like people a lot more. I get along with everybody. I've always gone along with everybody and I've also been the weird kid my whole life. I've lived in this weird dichotomy between being always the weird kid that stands out and also the kid that gets invited everywhere, but also the kid that stands out and also everybody likes me. But everyone likes me for the wrong reasons or the right reasons, but like the misunderstood reasons. And so I'm always sitting there like, why did you think I was like this? And it's because people usually like you based off their perception of you or they like you based off the things they understand. And I used to think they need to understand all of me to like me, but they just need to understand enough to like me because all the parts are me, right? It's reasonable, right? Like I'm not responsible for some random person on the street. But then we're still left with the problem of if you're not responsible and I'm not responsible and this person isn't responsible and this person isn't responsible, then who is responsible? Mm. So what I see is a group of people, and this is happening a lot with men. It's happening with women too. I see it more in minority women and frankly women who are don't adhere or don't have the biology to adhere to standard beauty standards. Some of the loneliest women. Oh, he just called ugly women out, bro. He's like, you're ugly. <laughs> I feel called out. <laughs> So what I see is a group of people, and this is happening a lot with men. It's happening with women too. I see it more in minority women and frankly women who are don't 
adhere or don't have the biology to adhere to standard beauty standards. Some of the loneliest women. And I have so many lonely female friends. I have so many female friends that aren't picked, that men don't ask out, that men don't want to be with. And I think they're pretty and lovely, but they're not picked. And I think that's interesting. You know what I mean? I was making a joke. I'm obviously not one of these women. <laughs> People sliding into my DMs way too often at this point. I'm so sorry. I know. Have you seen my oh my new OnlyFans shoot is so good. I'm not gonna play with you, but I've also been working out, so I get it. But he's talking about very specific kind of women. But I would say like the women I see who are lonely, I think they're pretty. Like AD, you know how we were talking about AD yesterday. A man in my comments was like, "Men don't find women like AD beautiful," and I was like, "What? Like her face? Like they don't think her face is beautiful?" And I'm like. How much prettier do you need women to get? Like, that's amazing to me. You know what I mean? Like, AD is so pretty to me. But like, do you get what I'm saying? Like, how much prettier do you want women to get? You know? It's just like so strange. You know what? Honestly, I wish everyone was a lesbian. I do. I'm glad I married a woman. It was the best decision I ever made. And... What happens is like these people don't know how to connect, right? Oftentimes from a young age, they're bullied. Technology enters the picture. We don't know how to end. Like we don't have social spaces anymore. We're spending all of our time on Discord. And then like once you're 29 years old and you've never been in a relationship and you don't quite know how to dress, when people look at you, what do they see? They see a creep. A creep is the most devastating label you can get. Because what does it mean to be a creep? Does it mean that you did something wrong? No. Does it mean that you're bad in some way? Like did you-, did you Ooh, Star said they need her not to be black then. That's where my mind goes. Honestly, bro, I kind of thought the same thing. I was like, yo, y'all racist. Because like- what else would AD have to do to be pretty? You know what I mean? I'm just saying. Lexi says we're too used to seeing highly edited women online. A lot of people have lost sight of what a woman actually looks like. You know what? I think men might have a harder time. I wonder if men have face blindness bad. Because, like, they will always say, like, Brittany, I can't tell what this woman looks like without makeup. I was like, really? And I don't know because like, it's not like I'm good at makeup or anything. I mean, I wear it for stream, but I'm not good at it. And so I always feel like I can tell what people look like without the makeup. You know what I mean? But men are always like, I can't tell what she looks like. I'm like, really? Like, that is such a confusing narrative to me. But I wonder if men have like a face blindness issue, some men, where they genuinely can't tell what women look like. So they feel like tricked. But like, if I even see a very heavily edited video on Instagram, I was like, I know what you look like, bitch. I never feel like I'm being tricked. I always feel like, oh, I know what you look like. Like, how much different can you look? And I don't think people look severely different. But sometimes these men will be like, oh, she looks completely different. I was like, Nah, even the girls I see with huge transformations where they do look very different in my brain. I'm like, nah, it's the same bitch. You know, I don't know. I can't tell. Actually do something. Are you a, a th thief? No. Are you harmful? No. <clears throat> You're a creep. What does that mean? It means that I don't want to spend time with you, but I don't have a very clear reason. That's why we mm. use the word creep, right? So if someone is like a rapist. The vibes. That makes sense. They're a rapist. That's why I don't want to spend. If someone's a thief. We have, we understand. If someone is a League of Legends player, we understand why no one wants to spend time with them. <laughs> <laughs> my husband the other day he's like i'm gonna go play league i was like am i married to a league player and he was like <laughs> okay but creep is like a word that we apply to this and like what a damning diagnosis because what do you do about that like you don't have social skills now you get ostracized now how are you supposed to get them and this is where we have another huge problem so if we look at show you another quick paper and jump ahead we there's another problem here um uh, bah, 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 bah. This is a paper called Masculinity, the Help Seeking Among Men with Depression, a qualitative study. Uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, okay, so like the other problem that we have is that as men, we don't know how to ask for help. And that's because we're raised with these masculine norms of independence, okay? And as we, we get raised with these norms of independence, <laughs> sorry for the wall I'll, I'll take it. I'll take a dig at a couple other games before we're done, okay? So we as men are not taught how to ask for help. And so there's like data that shows that women are taught how to ask for help. We'll, we'll show that a little bit later because there's a second point to it. So I think another huge problem that we have is if you're a man today, like you're, you're sort of taught that you're supposed to be independent, right? And this is where a lot of people will say like, oh, but like men, you know, when we talk about these societal norms, there's a, there's like a trend to say like, no, like I'm not like that, right? So we say like, okay, men should be allowed to, uh, like a man. And also societal based off your society. I looked up the average ages people move out of their homes. And I think Croatia was like in their 30s, in their 30s. Versus America, I think the average was, what, 20 or something like that? And so think about that as well. When they say, like, men are meant to be independent, 
my husband was an anomaly for having left his parents' house in his 20s. You know, because most people in Croatia leave their parents' homes in their, like, 30s unless they get married. And even then, you know, people sometimes live with their parents when they're married. So remember, like, societal norm, what is a man, what's the expectation, is a construct. It depends on where you live. Man expressing your emotions is absolutely okay. Like, men should be allowed to express their emotions. Really? Which ones? Yeah, which ones? What about anger, bitch? Men can cry. Oh, interesting. What if I have other emotions? What if I feel angry? Am I allowed to express that as a man? And this is where I, I think Destiny kind of reacts to this too. And I think I'm really lucky growing up in a Middle Eastern home where we were allowed to express feelings. Like I saw anger, sadness, crying. Like I saw, I mean, it was a little toxic masculinity for sure where we valued, I think, anger more than crying. Like I think you were made fun of a lot more for crying than anger. Anger was seen as a, a tough person thing. So like being angry, you were allowed to get angry because anger was strength growing up. So, you know, um, but yeah, I think there's something, wait, I forgot. Wait, what was my train of thought? Anger. Oh, so it's funny growing up in my bubble where like, I don't, I don't mind people being angry. You know what I mean? I don't mind people crying. I don't mind people expressing themselves. I mind if you target me in the process versus expressing it from within. So I don't mind if you express anger as long as you're not throwing shit at me. I don't mind if you express anger as long as you're not hitting me. I don't mind if you express anger as long as you're not targeting me with your anger. You know? It's a really common thing. So we as men are conditioned to, exp to express anger and feel anger. It's the only thing. Okay? We kind of like, we talked about this on Diary of CEO a little bit, and I think Destiny reacted to it. But basically, I was kind of pointing out that, you know, if you're getting bullied, what are you supposed to do as a dude? You're supposed to fight back. Right? And like, what we're supposed to do is get pissed. And you guys can watch any movie that has a male protagonist. I will guarantee you, I guess I can't guarantee, 99% confidence, I don't even watch movies anymore, that at some point the man will get angry in a righteous and positive way. And this will be a turning point in the movie. Right? You can watch a movie like Taken, where, <laughs> spoiler alert, it's about someone whose daughter gets abducted. And what does the man do? The man does what he's supposed to do, which is get pissed. And everyone is like, this is what a man should be. I want a dad like Liam Neeson. You can look at any an, anything. And then like, now we have this like very, very contrived vulnerability of like, oh yeah, like it's okay for a man to cry, but they're so manly when they cry. Yo. I love crying to One Piece with my partner. <laughs> we just got through an arc. I got so emotional today. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so good. Like they have such big muscles when they cry. Right? They don't show like the snot and the vomit and the dejection and the self-hatred and the self-loathing. They don't show the crying for hours and hours and hours. It's like five minutes and then there's a pat on the back and then there's like positive anger and then we're going to go fix our lives. Let's go be men, men about it and then we're going to have big dicks at the end of all that. So what, what happens, and, and this is a, such a common experience that I see in relationships is that women are conditioned that it's okay to cry. And by the way, women get fucked by not being able to express anger as well. Okay. So it's not like just because men have these challenges does not mean that women don't have challenges. And in fact, when it comes to anger, women especially are punished for it. So we're punished less as men. It's the only tool we're taught. But if you're, you're a woman and you get angry, especially in some place like the workplace, ho, 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 you'll be judged so harshly. Okay. But this is what happens. We're only taught to express anger. And then what happens is we've started to demonize anger in men. Right? It's testosterone. They're fundamentally violent. These creatures cannot be trusted. All men are bad. Men cannot be trusted. And what is it that triggers these? It's expressions of anger. So we're allowed to like sort of express our emotions, but they have to be the right emotions. And in this way, now we have entered the lot of women. Because That's why I eradicate gender in my bubble. So when I say like I created my own bubble and I know I understand I live within the Croatian bubble and I live within the European bubble and I live, I'm an American, so I, I also experience the American bubble. The bubble I have at, at home, in my own home, like my partner and I, we don't adhere to traditional gender roles. We don't care about them. We care only about our consciousness, our personhood. So these problems that people are facing, like, oh, you're such a man, you're such a woman, we have remnants of those problems. Like my husband will often joke, I suffer from toxic masculinity, which is partially true. I grew up in a very, you know, like toxic masculinity home, but also a very weird egalitarian home as well. I grew up in a very confusing bubble because the women worked, but also the men were the head of the household, but also the women organized everything. And also it was like my big, big fat Greek wedding, literally. The man is the head, but the woman is the neck. That's the bubble I grew up in. So women were really dominant, but also like, we're like, men are the head of the household. And I was like, okay, this feels kind of like a show, but okay. So my dad raised me to run a company and my mom raised me to be a stay-at-home mom. And then somehow they expected me to like understand the balance between the two, which is really ironic. Anyways, 
So in my bubble that I created, I didn't want gender to be the problem. When I was dating men after men after women after women after women, oh my God, the amount of gender that played a role in those conversations. As the man, I need to do this. As the woman, I need to do this. And I was like, I need to date somebody that doesn't care that they're a man or a woman. I need to date somebody that understands that people perceive that and treat you differently because of it. But in our own internal understanding of self, I don't need this to be a subject matter that like, as the man, I need to do as the woman, like, I don't, I don't want to have those conversations. Because like, that's not how I want to live my life. For the last 200 years, this has been true of women. Women are allowed to only express a slice of emotions and men are only allowed to uh, express a slice. Hold on, Lindsay, you said, how do you be a part of a community and also don't want to be bothered by people? You're asking a person that I bubble hop into communities and I visit as the star guest, like Fonzie, and then I leave. I come in, I'm like, oh, what's up? And then I bail. Because, you know, as much as I work to be a part of a community, I just don't vibe with it. Communities want you to act and be a specific way. Eventually, they want you to think like them and be like them. It's too exhausting for me. I'm okay being a part of a society, but being part of an inner community, it's really difficult. The closest I've gone to is my own community. And even then I have like a really strong boundary with people just out of appropriateness for the fact that I'm a content creator. But like my communities, I'm the solo friend. Like I don't have groups of friends I get along. All my friends, I'm the visitor. I come in and I'm like, what up friends? You know? So ask yourself, are you a community person? Or are you an individual person? I realized I'm an independent, like I'm an individual person. And all my besties are the same. All of our friend groups are separate. I'm not friends with my friends' friends. Like, we have some overlapping friends, but not really. Like, not really. You know, we do, but we don't. It's not the same. It's not what you imagine it is. You know, I usually have one-on-one -on -one friendships. I realize the community ones, just the drama is too much. Slice of emotions. And so, like, this is a, the kind of thing where we have to be independent. We express anger. We get ostracized. We, there's a sense of thwarted belongingness. And then what we end up with is we get called creeps. And then the worst thing is that we don't know how to ask for help. We don't, we're not taught how to ask for help. In fact, we're taught the opposite. And so then what ends up happening is that we don't know where to go. But we certainly know that there's one group of people on the internet who understands our plight. Mm. Right? Because the rest of the internet says, oh, yeah, you're a man. You're privileged. Everything Gucci for you. You, you don't understand how good you have it. <laughs> Stupid me. I didn't understand how good I had it. Right? And sometimes that's true. Mm. Sometimes you do have deeply narcissistic people who have no idea how good they have it. Maybe I'm one of them. Who knows? And so the one refuge that they have is the alpha males, the red pillars, and the incels. Ugh, gross. What if you're both? Then you got to learn how to have balance with your spoons, right? Lots of people are community people and solo people. I just think it's a matter of knowing yourself and your own boundaries and how to fulfill your joy. You know what I mean? Like I realized, okay, I used to dream of having like the weekend brunch people I would see every weekend. And I had that in my early 20s. In my early 20s, I had adult, I had my first adult friend group and we would see each other every weekend. We'd party every weekend. It was the great, it was a great couple of years. It was so much fun. Every year, every single weekend, we were fucking running around San Diego. It was so fun. But eventually, like when we wanted to get deeper and get to know each other outside of a group dynamic, that's the other thing with group dynamics it's hard to get one-on-one -on -one time with people. And then when you start to get one-on-one -on -one time with people and you get to really know people outside the group, the group starts to fall apart because people realize like, oh, that's what you believe and oh, that's what you're doing. And like, oh, like I didn't know you were that kind of a person because I didn't get to know you until we became a group. And because we became a group, I never got to pick you individually to be in the group. And so like groups for me seem to fall apart pretty easily. I mean, all you need is one person who burns the bridge and never talks to you again. Group destroyed. You can't be in the group anymore, right? So like, it's just what it is. It, it, like groups are great until you get to know each other one-on-one. -on -one. Then you realize like, I don't know if I even like you, bro. You know what I'm saying? So you have to decide what kind of a group person are you? Are you the kind of community member and group person that never shares your personal information that actually shows up and nobody knows anything about you? You never get close to people, but you like to be a part of a group. That's a different kind of group person. And everyone's like, oh my God, this is toxic masculinity. These people have nowhere else to go. They tried to join you and you kicked them out. So what do they do? Anytime you ostracize a group of people, they're going to form their own community. And so if you guys have a problem with toxic masculinity, like how about you be nicer to dudes so that you don't have to shut them all out and then they're going to congregate and then it'll get radicalized because that's what happens when you shut people out. And then the other problem is these people don't know how to ask for help. And so instead, the other real challenge here, and I don't blame people for disliking them, because the way in which they approach other people is so fucking toxic. 
right? They're like, oh, women are blah, 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 blah. And like, I deserve this and I'm entitled to this. And like, no one deserves anything and no one's entitled to anything. They exhibit behaviors and use dialogue that is so damn polemic, polarizing, antagonizing. And then once they piss us off, we're trying to be nice to them. And then they start opening, it's like opening up this can of worms where there's like litany of like red pill, whatever the fuck, sexual marketplace value and other kinds of pseudoscience mating bullshit that these people have never read a scientific paper, right? Maybe they have, I don't know. And like they have all these like ideas, right? Like alpha and beta, which like the original person was like, this is not correct. The original researcher who coined the term. And then they say things that make us not want to help them. It's so hard. And we're not taught how to ask for help, right? Like how do you ask for help? You can say, you can point out what your deficiency is. You can point out- You know out how you ask for help? Okay. This is what I- Hello? Oh my God, my whole mic. Fuck. This is how I would give advice to somebody who's hyper-independent, somebody who's like a man who doesn't want to ask for help, somebody who is like struggling because they think of help as like too vulnerable because people will know your business. So I would tell them to do this. So maybe I'm wrong. I would say, think about helping yourself the way you would help your dog or your car or something external to yourself, like your problem solving. I looked at myself and said, oh, I'm not acting as efficiently. Something is terribly wrong. How do I fix this thing? This thing being me. I'm the thing, right? And then I got to fix that thing. So when I'm fixing that thing, I have to problem solve it like a machine. So if it's too vulnerable to ask your community, if it's too vulnerable, hire people. You have money. You have status or get that. You might have to get it. You might have to put it on a credit card. But like, you know, you can go to a doctor to fix your bones. You can go to a therapist to help you with your brain. You can hire a mentor in philosophy. You can go to retreat centers. You can actually pay your way into getting help. And you don't have to involve anybody in your community. You never have to tell anybody. If you're afraid of the vulnerability, you can get help and ask for help from people that spend their life dedicated to helping people just like you who aren't in your personal life. If you're struggling with the vulnerability aspect, you don't have to ask your community. You can ask strangers who have dedicated their life to helping people exactly like you. Doubt that you're striving for something and then you can ask for help, right? So this is stuff that I literally teach my patients. Hey, I noticed that I'm not very good at making friends. I would love to be like a better human being and a member of a community and contribute to like the people around me. Can you please help me strengthen my relationships? Will the help be shitty? Only if you're shitty at looking for help. You have to do the work. I had to email over 72 therapists before two got back to me. Okay. A lot got back to me, but said I couldn't help you. When I emailed those 72 therapists, about 15 or so got back to me and said, hey, Brittany, it doesn't sound like I'm the person to help you, which is amazing of them. So it's not just a cash grab. They said, hey, I'm not the person to help you. I recommend somebody in this work of therapy. And I said, okay. And so I reached out to more and more therapists. Like you have to be the, the, the discerner. Just like I had a shitty first therapist, I had to fire her. Yes, congratulations. You're gonna have to do some of the work, you fucking lazy bums. You're gonna have to do some of the fucking work. Yes, you. It's your life. If you, come on, you're gonna have to do some of the work, okay? You're gonna have to find the right therapists, find the right doctors, find the right answers. Yes, you're going to have to do some of the fucking work and then you're going to get the help you need because it's a it's a, a thing you never do truly alone because you can't study every field of medicine. You can't study every field of psychology. You can't study every field of everything in order to know how to help yourself. You have to rely on other people that have spent their life studying. We stand on the shoulders of giants. We rely on other people to have figured out how cars work and electricity and food so we can end up going about our life. But some of the work you're going to have to do for yourself, especially since it's about you. Okay? That's the thing. Point out a flaw that you have. Pick a goal that you want to strive towards and then ask for help. Mm. Mm. Hey, I noticed a deficiency. This is where I want to go. Oh, damn. He just said it. Find out what your deficiency is. Figure out how to ask for help in that thing. Damn, Dr. Kate and I are reading each other's minds. Can you help me? One, two, three. This is the best way to ask for help. I don't know that scientifically. I don't look at like... I agree. Meta-analysis on different methods of help seeking. Right? But we're not taught this. So someone struggles like they don't know what to do. They get judged as a creep. They have fewer economic opportunities. And we're going to get... I have other ones. Hold on. I have more papers. I'm not done with the papers. Uh, give me a second. Okay. I'm going to pause here.
So I'm going to ask you all, okay, what do you all want from me? We've got 45 minutes left. So if you all want, I will talk to you about my take on the pathogenesis and how to approach suicidality in men. It's not that I dislike women. It's that there are gender specific things. I'm actually actively working on two lectures right now. One is ADHD for women. Second is autism in women. So I think there are gender specific manifestations of mental illness, which need to be addressed. It just takes me a little bit longer to do the stuff on women because I'm not a woman, which means that I have to do like more research because I don't want to be paternalistic, right? So I have to just, it takes me twice as long to prepare a lecture for women as it does to prepare a lecture for men because I have 41 years of experience being a dude. Mm. Okay. Do you guys have any questions about what I've talked about so far? I have to pee. I have to pee very badly. I'm really annoyed. I got to I got to pee. I got to pee. I'll be right back. Keep, uh, should I keep, should I have you keep watching? You can just tell me what he said. I'll keep it going. I'll be two minutes. I'll be literally two minutes. Keep watching. Tell me what he said. And then, uh, I doubt he's going to say much right now. It seems like he's kind of going into the, the chat right now. I'll be right back. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working on it, Rosalie. Um, then be a woman. I'm working on that too. <laughs> Okay. All right. So <laughs> Okay. So All right. Do you guys want to talk more about male suicidality? Do you all have questions or like what? I mean, I see <laughs> feet pics and only fans. <laughs> I have no idea how to interpret that, but that's not going to happen today because we're talking about the importance of male suicide. Okay? So I'm the prize chat. Okay. Okay. So we're going to talk about, all right. So we're going to talk more about male suicide. Okay. I don't know who to ask for help. Okay, great. Or not great, but we're going to address that. All right. Okay. All right. Let's start by looking at a paper. This is a fantastic paper. Exploring the psychology of suicidal ideation, a theory driven network analysis. So let's understand why people kill themselves. So, if we look at theoretical models for suicidal behavior, this is something that we're going to be talking about. I'm going to show you all the actual model, and then I'll talk you all through it, okay? So, thwarted belongingness is I'm trying to connect with other people, and I'm alone. And perceived burdenness, I'm a burden. And then capability of suicide, and then desire for suicide, and then this is kind of the Venn diagram. And if you fit all these things, th this is when you're at high risk. So, the other thing to kind of think about is if we look at how someone ends up committing suicide, what we see is that it's way more complicated than a mental illness. So we have what's called pre-motivational phase, the background factors and triggering events. So this is the way that you were raised, the way that you see the world. And then we have motivation and volition. So let's understand the difference between motivation and volition. Motivation is what I want, right? It is my drive. Volition is my actions. And so what we tend to see is that over time, what will happen for people who are suicidal, and I'm going to sort of refer to men sometimes and just suicidal people sometimes. The different papers are looking at different things. Okay? So what, what tends to happen is we have a sense of entrapment. So I'll give you all kind of like, um, and I think it's internal entrapment. Hold on, let me make sure I have this right. Internal entrapment. I anticipate. Yes, okay. So what tends to happen is we start off with like kind of this, this unfortunate situation, which we'll get into. Then what happens is we feel trapped. And more often we feel trapped by our internal circumstances, more so than our external circumstances. And we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be trapped. What it means to be trapped is basically that your internal environment is not something that you can get away from. So every day becomes suffering. Every day becomes hopeless. Every day, there is a negative space within you that you cannot act to change. This is a very common experience. It's a very powerful variable is this experience of like, I can't change the way that I feel. And then what happens is we have something called volitional factors. So this is what we focus on a lot as clinicians. So we focus on things like access to suicidal means. So we try to remove guns from the house. What did I miss? What did I miss? Hold. We try to like make it hard for people to commit suicide because oftentimes suicidal behavior is impulsive. Mm. So it's very common. I want to say like 90% of people decide to kill themselves within one hour of doing it. Uh, I could be wrong on the specific statistics there. I think 50% make a decision within five minutes and then like it's 80 to 90% or within one hour. So this sort of idea that we have from the media that everyone like puts their affairs in order is probably not correct. There's some awesome research by Matt Nock, also Maltzberger. These are two excellent suicide researchers. Strongly recommend you check out their work. So what we kind of see from this theory of suicide is that it's kind of like this stretch of like stuff that kind of gets put together. And as we <sighs> talk about men, let's like, I'm going to focus on men for a little bit. Because men? Relevant. Men? What are we doing let's understand how men? this happens. So how does a man become suicidal? So if we look at diseases of despair. What we start with, we start to realize is I'm a dude. And as a good man, I'm supposed to do certain things. I'm supposed to be independent. Right? 
I'm- destroy gender roles, gender expectation. Don't you love how we literally everything that seems to be wrong with men is highly re- relating to them being men? And the expectation of them being men. Aren't you guys exhausted? Who decided? You know what I mean? Who decided? Kay says, Brid, do your ears get fucked up from only listening to this shit from one side so much? No. Um, funny enough, my left ear is worse than my right ear. But when I put it in my right ear, it feels wrong texture wise. So I can't do it. And then when I have two ears in, I feel like I can't think. That's why I don't use headphones. I just feel like I can't think. I also have a pressure headache that's been happening. And I feel like the headaches get worse when I'm like, when I'm like all encompassed in. I'm supposed to be self-sufficient. I'm supposed to be capable. I'm supposed to be strong. Right? This is what it means to be a man. I'm supposed to take care of others. There's also another really interesting variable here. I'm supposed to be able to tolerate pain. So this is a really interesting gender-specific suicidal manifestation. Mm. So people have been asking themselves for a while, why do men kill themselves at four times? Why do, for every one woman who kills herself, four men kill themselves? Why? So one of the interesting hypotheses is that as men, we are taught to tolerate pain. And if you ask people... (laughs) Women are very masochistic. What keeps you from killing yourself? Oftentimes people will say, I'm afraid of the pain. Mm. So if you look at a protective factor against suicide, it's pain. So my, my, since I'm such a wuss and I'm afraid of pain, I'm not going to kill myself. Mm. But literally there are studies that explore this, right? I don't know how conclusively they show it. That basically as men get better and better at tolerating punishment, right? Because it's always like, you know, if your family gets attacked by a tiger, it's not women and children to the front. It's men to the front, right? Like literally, like when it comes to military conscription and stuff like that, it's like we send men into war to die. Like we're expected to do this. We're expected to experience pain and suffering and whatever. I'm not going to get into the... Which is crazy, by the way biological, evolutionary, whatever of that, and whether that's good or bad, or I don't know, it's beyond my area of expertise. But what we do know is that men are taught to take punishment. And since we're good at taking punishment, we're like, it's easier for us to kill ourselves because we're not afraid of the pain. It's like the pain of death ain't nothing compared to the pain of life. Okay? So now this creates other kinds of problems. So we also have a couple of other things. One is that we are alexithymic. Mm. Okay. That's the that's what Maiden said earlier, didn't you? Okay. And this means that we are unaware of our internal emotional state. Mm. And then the other thing that we've got going for us is a combination of these two things. Since we don't manage our emotions, we don't ask for help, we don't do any of that stuff, then we've got this pile of emotions. And we also tend to use substances and addictions Mm. to treat them. This is what men do, right? Remember this? The diseases of despair? Let's take a look. 37, 94% alcohol-related and substance-use-related diagnoses. 55% were the largest increase in alcohol and substance-related diagnoses. Holy Jesus. 172% 172% increase in substance-related diagnoses between the ages of 55 and 74. That's because the boomers, uh, this is a, uh, ageism, so I'm going to rephrase, but in a more factual way, I was about to say, the boomers don't believe in emotions. No, no, so but practically what that is, is that the boomer generation was not taught EQ skills, even at the level that we're taught today. Mm-hmm. So they struggle more with emotions than we do because it was like, you think they're bad with us about emotional validation? You should see their parents. Their parents were way worse than they are. Like the boomer generation has done an awesome job in many ways. I know it's like, oh my God, this is going to get me canceled. But like they had it rough too. They had some things that were really good, like mm-hmm. unprecedented economic growth. <laughs> okay. But they struggle too. All right. And for the record, I don't think it helps to crap on any group of people. Like it just doesn't help us be more compassionate. Like we're all in this together. The nicer we are to the boomers, hopefully the nicer they'll be to us. We should all be nice to each other. We're all in this together. Like life is not a zero sum game where in order for me to win, you have to lose. It's like a fucking game of Dota where if you int and run down. Mi- I feel like my parents are, well, they're 65. Is that boomer? I feel like they're great at acknowledging emotions, but not great at acknowledging why you have those emotions. And they're not great at acknowledging the solution being anything other than what they think it is. So they're fine with you being upset. They're fine with you crying. They're fine with you like yelling or being angry, though there was some shame associated with crying. They didn't, it's not like they punished you for crying. It's not like they put you in your room without dinner or something, you know, but they weren't good at like the solution part of it. They weren't good at actually, um, allowing for an answer other than the one that they have decided is the answer from their bubble right mid you ruin things for yourself and you ruin things for your teammate like we're in this together okay so what does this create and for the women in my audience who identify with the data from the men i think that that makes sense you know what i mean for a lot of millennial girls for a lot of people especially in my audience i assume a lot of the women in my audience are workers 
I assume that they're older sisters. I assume they have a lot of responsibilities. I assume in a lot of ways we've had to be the responsible ones in our family. I'm not associating all my audience with that, just some of them. So if you feel like you're identifying with the men's statistics, I wonder how much that plays a role in that. So this creates like a problem because if you're a dude and you have a good life, then things are actually pretty good because you may not need the help as much. You have some advantages of a patriarchal society. I, as a medical student, got mistaken as a doctor. My female colleagues, when they were doctors, got mistaken for nurses. Like there are some advantages to being a man. But what I tend to find is that these advantages are really, really like capitalized on by men who have good lives. So men who have the opportunity for higher education. Fuck ups like myself. Like if my parents were poor, I would not be here today. The only reason that I'm, I'm here today is when I failed out of college, I had someone who was there to pay my rent. I had someone who could send me to India and study yoga and meditation. I had someone to help me financially support myself through medical school. And if they hadn't helped support me through medical school and my wife helped support me through medical school, then I would be so racked up in loans that I would have never been able to start Healthy Gamer. Right? So like I am, I am born a privilege and I'm grateful for that. And I think those of us that are born for privilege should try to do something good in the world in what capacity we have. And I would love it if other people who are privileged didn't wait till they were dead to do their charity. Right? Like, we need your help now for those of y'all that are very, very capable of helping. And I get that it's like an awesome charitable donation to, in your will. Leave your money to good organizations. Like, I'm grateful for that. But like, you know, if you really want to be nice, can you do it while you're alive? Because in the 30 years that you're still going to be here, like, people need help too. Anyway, mm. the challenge is that if you have a bad life. Cognitive, you, I appreciate your presence here, but sometimes you sound miserable. You said crying is regarded as manipulative behavior in many cases unless you fell down or something. How is that even possible, bros? How is it even possible? You know, I'm sorry, guys. I don't mean to worry you. I'm I'm getting a really piercing headache. I'm fine. I'm getting a very, like, I hope it's not turning into a migraine. I had a, I haven't had a migraine in a few years now. And the other day I felt one coming. And so my husband turned off all the lights in the house and put a cold compress on my head. I feel like I might need to go grab my cold compress. I'm feeling like I get this like piercing pinch in my head and then it feels really nauseating. If it feels really bad, I'll stop stream, but I want to keep going for as long as I can. But ooh, I'm feeling like, you know, when you, if any of you suffer from migraines, I just don't want it to turn into a migraine, but I'm, I'm keeping tabs on it. I might go grab my cold compress maybe, but I'm okay. I'm okay. It's very hard for men to recover. And that's because we're supposed to be independent. So no help. Okay. We don't know what we're feeling emotionally. And so without emotional awareness and emotional healing, these emotions negatively impact us. So for example, when I feel ashamed, what is the purpose of shame? The purpose of shame is to enact corrective behavior. So if I feel ashamed for not having money, so I have very little money, right? So this is the kind of thing where like what I'm supposed to do is like work hard and get a job and pull yourself up by our bootstrap, son. Come on, come on, boy. Bootstrap time. Let's go. Come on. But this only works if I live in an environment that has economic opportunity. And this is why we see diseases of despair, like literally like in like Wales and Scotland and places like this. Because in these situations, like you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps as much as you want to. There's no up. There's no up. Nowhere to go. Like these are like fishing villages that no longer have fish. Wait, cognitive. Are you saying crying can be seen as manipulative or crying is manipulative or crying? Because I didn't grow up in that bubble. I didn't grow up in a bubble where crying is seen as manipulative. I've only grown up in a bubble where crying is seen as weakness, which is not the same thing. Right? So like, are you saying you grew up in a bubble where you think crying is manipulative or crying? Because that sounds miserable to think like all crying is mis like all crying is manipulative. I was never told that. I was told crying is weakness, not that it's manipulative. Because the only people who could cry and be manipulative are like, like, how would that ever work in an environment unless you rewarded? Okay, you meant scene. Okay, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. Because if you see crying as manipulative, that means someone taught you that crying is manipulative. So like, why did that environment think that of manipulation? Hold on, let me go get my cool, let me go get my cool compress. Let me see if that helps. Tell me if I miss anything. It's like a huge problem in the UK. Okay. And so then we don't know, like we don't talk to people. We don't know how to ask for help. And then what we end up doing is self-medicating. Right. And this is where we sort of end up with like slow suicide, which is addiction. And what do I base that on? I'm kind of clustering it into diseases of despair. If you look at the research on diseases of despair, what you dis uh, diseases of despair, what you discover is that there is a common element that leads to substance use and suicide. That's why we cluster them because there's a shared root. Okay. And then what ends up happening is like we're kind of stuck. So now what happens is that I'm here, 
And then I have, remember this, this is my objective versus my malfunction. I can't find one of the papers I was looking for. Maybe it's this one. This isn't the one I'm looking for. I will find it. So here's what we kind of know. So now what we've got, oh, sorry. Now we, go, well, now we get back to this thing, right? So now we have a human being whose objective life is not very good. So they have very little in the way of relationships. They have very little in the way of prospects. They have very little in the way of romance, right? And so one person may have like one of these three, like so people will have some amount of this. And then, then what happens is this over time creates cognitive distortions, absolutely. And this leads to mental illness. Okay, so if we kind of go, go look at our diseases of despair diagram, right? So then we get to this region. So this is like the circumstances. And then we start to see all these problems within us. And then this results in mental illness, substance use disorders, depression, suicidal ideation. Okay. Now, this is where, you know, when, when Destiny says, like, yeah, I think at some point, like, even if their lives are objectively bad, they become mentally ill. And he's not wrong. I, I personally don't agree with that. But I think it's a completely defensible position. Now, the challenge is that when things become mental illness, the antidote is therapy or medical treatment, which I'm in favor of. But here's what I honestly feel. So if you're a therapist who's alive today, and this is the reason I started Healthy Gamer. So people would come into my office and they'd say, like, I'm depressed. And I'd say, why are you depressed? They're like, I've got no job. I've got no girlfriend. I play video games all day. And I was like, you know what, bro? That sounds like a pretty depressing life, right? I would de be depressed too. And then the more that I started helping people, the more that I started to realize that we as therapists are here to try to help people with their cognitive biases, the malfunctions of their mind. But so many of their problems are outside of the office. So many of their problems are actually bad things in their life, not malfunctions up here. And so what it feels like to me as a therapist, I'll just give you all an analogy. So like, you know, there's like the king or the queen. And that is the hardest part because like as a child growing up, who eventually got diagnosed with borderline, right? I was told like, how could you even be sick? Your life is so good. How could you even be unhappy? Like everything is so great. How could you ever like, how could you ever complain about anything? Look at your life. And like, that's the problem I hear. And that's why I think I was sympathetic and empathetic to Hassan even complaining or even venting rather, because I don't like complainers. But it's like, yeah, you don't know what's really going on in people's lives. And so when you have that kind of conversation, and you say those kinds of things, I don't think it sends the message that you think it's sending. So it's like, oh, okay, you go to somebody and you say to them, I'm really feeling this way. It's like men. If men feel ashamed to express their emotions, do you think women aren't going through the same thing? And why are we doing that to each other? Why are we the ones creating that narrative? Whether we're men or women, we are creating an environment that is punishing people for expressing their needs saying, hey, something is going on with me. And the only response you get is your life is so good. What are you complaining for? Your life is so good. What do you mean? You're socially drained. Your life is so good. What do you mean it's hard doing your job? It, you're, you, what do you mean? And it's like, well, this can't be the answer. And the king or the queen has like the queen's guard or the king's guard. So you have these like elite soldiers, small number, 20 of them. And we're here to protect the king. We're the last line of defense. And what it feels like to be a therapist today is to be the king's guard and have no other soldiers ahead of you. There are huge macro level forces of people who are unemployed or underemployed. Inflation, 50% of people under the age of 30 are living at home. We have toxic workplaces. We have all kinds of like problems. We've got social media and video games and pornography. And there's all this tide of crap that we can't hold at bay. These are the macro forces, which there are plenty of research studies about. If you guys want to see them, I can show them to you later. And then what we are as therapists, we're like the king's guard. We're like the last line of defense. It's like, if you're suicidal today, we're going to send you to the emergency room and we're going to do really intensive stuff. But we as a society are not fixing all of the stuff that got you here. Mm -hmm. And so therapy is incredibly important. We do a noble job, but holy shit, are we outgunned? Yep. We are so outgunned. We literally, yes. I trained for eight years. Because therapy isn't the only tool we need as a society, you know? And so that's the problem is like, it's not just therapy we need. So they can't do everything. So when I say go to therapy, it's one of the many tools we're going to need to and it's society. ultimately about the meaning crisis, which is why Verveke's work is the philosophy's part of Dr. K's work, which is the psychology part. Go to therapy so you can do philosophy. Right, that's like King's Guard material right there. Eight years of training. But when I look at the majority of people who walk into my office, more economic opportunity. Having other humans in your life. Like, I, I can help you with your cognitive distortions. I cannot make up for the deficiency of hugs from yep. the last 10 years of your life. Yep. A loneliness epidemic. Yep is going on right now. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong with our society. 
as we become more and more independent, we have stopped taking responsibility for each other as human beings. Mm. I can't fix that as a psychiatrist. I can do a lot. I can help you with your cognitive distortions. I'm going to treat whatever malfunctions you are. And we do an awesome job. Mm -hmm. We're all fucking burnt out, by the way. But if you really look at some of these things, and I can't find the paper, but there's one really good diagram that really illustrates how there are these macroeconomic forces that then cascade down into an individual. And then this person enters the office. And we can do a lot, but like really the, what we're seeing is a very tight correlation between the worsening of economic conditions and the worsening of mental illness. Mm -hmm. Because when a human being doesn't have a life that's worth living, it's easy to become suicidal. Let's go. And so what should you do about it? Mm -hmm. So the first thing, get therapy. Seek help. Mm -hmm. Right. So I say this as someone who made a video that went viral about why therapy sucks for men. I still think y'all should get therapy. I'm a therapist. I think it's great. I'm an advocate for it. And it is insufficient. But that's where we're going to start. Okay. So here's why. A couple of things. So if you are a man who is suicidal today, the reason that I think you should not give up is because chances are you have not received the help that you need. And the life that you're living today is basically you're playing an MMORPG, but offline and by yourself. Yeah. This is content that was designed as a 40-man raid, but you're not connected to the internet. And of course, you're going into fucking Blackwing Lair or whatever, Ragnaros, right? And I'm my like level 60 rogue. Let's go to Ragnaros. And then Ragnaros two shots me. And I'm like, what the fuck? And then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be resilient. So I respawn, I repair my fucking gear, I go and grind, right? Because I can't clear instances, so I like grind on boars, there's no auction house. So I grind on boars for like 15 hours, and I sell them for some measly amount of silver, and then I repair my gear, and then I go in to fight Ragnaros again, and I wipe. This is what it's like to be depressed. Everything you do is harder. People don't understand that if you're not mm -hmm. depressed. The things mm -hmm. that we take for granted is people who are mentally well. Like, <laughs> try to play WoW by yourself and see how far you get. That's what it's like to be depressed. So there, I'm not disputing that your lives are bad. But what I think consistently helps is help. And this is where it's incredibly challenging because some people will say, I've been, and I've had these people too. They'll be like, I've seen six therapists, six psychiatrists, nothing helps. Mm. So we're going to talk about that for a second. Mm. We're going to talk about help. Okay? Where's my fucking paper? Yeah, I want to know what he wants to say no, about this. this. So this, this is, is where I think I there's, there's a big challenge in therapy right now. Mm. So let's take a look at men's social relationships and mental health, okay? Um, most sex differences studies focus on two broad types of support. Emotional support, which includes emotional sustenance and empathy, for example. Mm -hmm. Someone being available to listen or offer sympathy during a time of crisis. Now, hold on. Don't read any more. So, if you're a dude in the audience today, or you know someone who's suicidal, has some suicidal ideation, right? Go get help, for real. Go to the emergency room, get some help. And I would offer you, hello, I'm here to talk to you about your problems. We're going to talk about how you feel bad. We're going to talk about your feelings. And I'm going to say, oh my god, that's so hard for you. That must be so hard for you. Oh my god. That must be so hard for you. That must be so hard for you. That's not what the men who come to my practice want. They love it. <laughs> That's not what they want. If I try to give it to them, they reject it. I squeeze it in little bits. What do they want? Hey, I want to do something about my life. I want to fix my problems, right? Because remember, some of these people aren't mentally ill. Their brain isn't malfunctioning and they have objective problems and they want, can y'all, can y'all guess? They want instrumental support, which includes practical assistance or tangible help from others. For example, help that requires physical effort or financial aid. So this isn't, I'm not giving them loans and I'm not helping them move. But what I tend to find is if you look at a lot of men's frustration with therapy, what they're really looking for is something called instrumental support. And this is not what the majority of our therapy is. This is not what the majority of therapists are trained on. We're trained in emotional support. But what we find is that like instrumental support is like really, really effective for men. So like when a dude, like literally I had a, my psychotherapy teacher, right? So I had a didactic 16 weeks of here's what psychotherapy is. And a psychoanalyst comes in and says, and maybe I'm doing them. They taught me a lot of good stuff, right? So, so don't, they're not bad people. They're brilliant. But they're like, when a patient walks in and says, can you help me get a girlfriend? What are you supposed to say? And I was like, I don't know, maybe. And he's like, the right thing to say is, what makes you want a girlfriend? What's it like to not have a girlfriend? Those are all useful questions. But something that's happened in therapy is we've stopped accepting responsibility for the outcomes of our patients. We'll accept outcomes in terms of mental health measures. So we'll say like, okay, mm -hmm. PHQ-9 score, GAD-7 score, we're going to reduce your anxiety, we're going to reduce your depression. That's going to be great. But as a profession, we've basically said like, we're not going to help you get a girlfriend, get a boyfriend. Well, wouldn't it be inappropriate to kind of do that in a way? You know what I mean? Like, wouldn't that be sort of inappropriate? Wouldn't that be a little weird? You know? Allison says, how do you prepare your cold compress? My husband does it for me. He, he like, um, he does it. He just gives it to me. I think it's just like, uh, wrapped in, I put it, we were put in this extra cloth because sometimes it gets too cold for me and I need different layers, but it's just an ice pack inside of a, like a blanket or a pillowcase. And then I just use it throughout the night to go to bed when I have a headache. I'm having a, re like, I think I am having i'm just trying not to get a migraine so i'm trying to like stifle it so but i'm listening i'm listening my brain is working it's just my eyes hurt when i look at the light so that's why i turned off my my ring light we're not gonna help you get promoted we're not gonna help you be a millionaire we can't do that 
which I also disagree with. Like, I think if there's anyone on the planet that can help you do that, it's actually going to be a therapist. What? Because we disagree. It's going to be a philosopher or philosophy. The meaning crisis. That's interesting. I didn't. That's interesting. We've got an awesome skill set. And what we see is like therapists who work with their clients do get those kinds of outcomes. But we become afraid to try to help people with instrumental support. So try to find a therapist. And I'd say you need to see three. OK, because it's about fit. And then recognize like, hey, I need help like accomplishing some of my goals. And this is what I would say to a therapist. I want to like accomplish certain things in life. And I want to better understand what are the things inside me that prevent me from doing what I want. Can you please help me with this? Mm. Right. And throw in a please. It's part of what helps in terms of asking for help. So step number one, don't kill yourself. Step number two, get emergency services if you need them. Step number three, find a therapist. Because mm -hmm, this is still mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. best evidence-based approach. When we look at the swaths of humanity, we still know. Oh, man. I wish I had some sunglasses. I don't even own sunglasses. Those would have been so good. Marina, I don't have sunglasses. Is that weird? I don't have sunglasses, Amaris. I know. I should have some. Know that there is one intervention that works pretty well, which is psychiatric help. So we're going to do that. And there's a lot more that we're going to do. Next thing that you need to do is work on alexithymia. Alexithymia is the inability to tell what your internal emotional state is. And here's why. So if we look at a lot of the behaviors that create the circumstances that make you not want to live your life, a lot of those are due to emotions. Mm. So you may not think that they are due to emotions, but this is what happens. We have negative emotions. Negative emotions are supposed to prompt us towards action. So emotions are a source of information and they're a source of motivation. They give us energy and they give us info. Okay. There's a whole segment on this on the trauma guide where we kind of explain this. So if you're interested in what I'm, or if you like what I say, definitely check that out. So the problem, though, is that as men, we're taught to suppress our emotions. And on top of that, we engage in behaviors that further suppress our emotions. So if you think about the most powerful motivators for behavior, they're actually emotions, right? Any movie you look at, some guy gets bullied and he's like, never again. Like, I'm going to get swollen. I'm going to be mm, I'm just, no, like the shame is going to strike. Like, I'm going to be the best and I'm going to be the mm. Right? This is what happens in all of our movies, right? Mean Girls, we see that too. We're like, Lindsay Lohan is like, I'm going to, I feel lots of emotion. I'm going to become the winner because of it. So negative emotion is a powerful source of information, a powerful source of motivation. But the problem is that it hurts. And so as we look at our lives and we think there's no way that I can actually fix this, I try to suppress it. Mm. The problem is when I suppress it, it doesn't go away. I just suppress it. And we also know that suppressing your emotions is a large source of willpower drain. So if you are suppressing your emotions and you don't feel them, you may not even be doing it consciously, you're actually like cutting your willpower bar in half, right? I don't know if you all play Elden Ring, but like in Elden Ring, there's this one particular attack that reduces your max health bar. So even if you heal, you can only go up so much. And this is what suppressing our emotions does for us. And so then what happens is not only do we, are we losing access to this powerful motivational fuel, but it is costing us a lot, a lot to suppress this stuff. So what we really need to do is get in touch with our emotions and process those fuckers. Mm. Let's process them. What does it mean to process them? That means to make it go away forever. Well, I also think like this is like that introspection tool that I don't think a lot of people are going to... I think like therapy will help you dissect where the emotions are coming from as well as introspection will go into that. And then the meaning crisis will further your introspection into the why. Like, why am I even getting better? Like, I would love to know why we're even going to therapy. Well, I want a girlfriend. It's like, okay, but like, even if you get better, you don't, you're not guaranteed a girlfriend because that takes the consent of another person. So it's like, oh, I want to get a better job. It's like, okay, that's a pretty good reason. But like, to what end, you know? Right. So think about that. This is what we try to do. We're like, I don't like my emotions. Yeah, I know you don't like them. That's because they suck. And we want to make them go away from it forever. But the way that we're going to do that is by processing and healing, not drinking. Drinking doesn't make them go away forever. It just makes them go away for a little while and they come back worse. So you look at literally studies on alcohol. What we know is that they make you feel better from a mood perspective temporarily and they make you feel worse over time. And then we get stuck in these addictive patterns where I'm going to do this thing today because it makes me feel good today. And then I'm screwing over tomorrow me and then screwing over the next me and the next. And then you get stuck in this cycle. Which is why I always ask myself, like, what does Brittany need from 10 years from now? Like, what does that version of myself need from me? Like at 30 or 45, like what is she going to need for me to do now that's going to benefit her later? Like I want her to make as many decisions as she wants to make at 45. And I just want to give her as many tools as possible when she gets there. So when she makes that choice, she has more options, you know? How do you break the cycle? By confronting your emotions. You got to let that shit out, baby. Let's go. And this is where we need companionship. We need support, right? So there's one of the papers that I showed today talks about male support and how it's like really good. Like, bros need bros. We don't have a space for each other anymore. And women are struggling from this, too. I don't know where women hang out anymore. Your mom's house. <laughs> and so step number one is get help. Step number two is manage your emotions. And then the cool thing is step number three is, like, instrumental support. See, once you do number one and number two, then you are actually in a place to fix your life. Because it, the problem is that we try to jump straight to step number three. But when we're jumping straight to step number three, we're, like, handicapped. We have so many debuffs that attempts that we make to fix our lives, like, we're, shoot, like we're, we're driving with a leaky gas tank. And then we make a critical mistake which is that I tried 100% and it didn't work, which is not, you're not wrong there. And by the way, this is when we get back to these kinds of comments, right? 
Um, right? So like this is where, why, what, what does it mean when someone is like objectively hopeless? Like what do we mean by that? Guys, do I look cool right now, bro? Is this like a mood? <laughs> what I'm talking about here is that these people try and try and try and try and try and they don't get anywhere. So then they, and I think it's reasonable, right? So if we were like an alien species and we saw someone perform an experiment where they tried to improve their life 6,000 times and it didn't work. What do you think is the objective conclusion? Improving my life is impossible, right? That's like a reasonable scientific conclusion. Now their study is flawed. I don't think that's actually correct in some way, but I think it's a reasonable objective interpretation. It can be changed, but that doesn't mean that they're malfunctioning. That just means that the way that they've been playing the game of life is going to result in those kinds of, of results. Yep. And so then comes the instrumental support. And what I've actually found is that like, as a therapist, doing a lot of instrumental support, especially for my male patients, is very helpful. It's part of the reason we created a coaching program, right? So I recently heard, anyway, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but we recently approached by someone, like a group of people at, anyway, who, I'm not gonna, I, I can't talk about it, so never mind. So the point is like, we created like this coaching program to, because I noticed that there was a deficiency of instrumental support, right? And at the time I was, I was at McLean Hospital, which is a great hospital, like arguably best psychiatric hospital in the country, in the United States, probably one of the top five in the world. And so like the chief of psychiatry there, the CEO is like, hey, you should really check out this, this cool thing we have here called the Institute of Coaching. And I was like, this is cool. Hmm. Right, so they started an institute that's all about coaching, which was started by uh, a therapist who specializes in positive psychology, works with a lot of corporations. Hmm. And so there's instrumental support. And the whole thing is that if you want to put together your life, this is what it takes. It takes these three things. The first thing is to not die. Bluntly. Right? In the great words of Randy Marsh, I didn't hear no bell. The only time you lose at life is when you ring the bell. Hmm. This is, I believe, 100%. Hmm. I didn't hear no bell. As long as you keep, as long as you stick around, there's a chance. And the biggest thing that people miss is help. So start by staying alive. Secondly, getting professional help. Third, focus on your emotions. And fourth, get instrumental help. Actually start fixing your life. Mm. Take yeah. a problem yep. that you have, something that you want to change. Didn't I just say this 10 minutes ago? Solve the problem. Take your life. Solve the problem. And this is where literally. Like you were solving a video game or a puzzle. Do you know how to wipe your butt? That's a problem. How do you learn how to solve that problem? You learn to wipe your butt all of the content that I've made for the last four years, five years. If you'll ask, how do I do that? That's what I've been saying for five years. This is how. Recognize that anything you try to do in life, there's going to be this internal thing that holds you back. The way that you perceive the world is going to change. Is all Let's go. Altered. Right, I'll show you all just a simple example of this. So one of the things that we taught recently in, our, in one of our members lectures, right? So lives not worth living is bullshit intended to pander to a social media audience. Now, if we look at this, this person, Ugh, Noah's tweets were the worst, is assuming that I'm doing this to pander to a social media audience. This doesn't come from me. This comes from their mind, right? And it's a, I'm not saying it's an unreasonable conclusion. I'm not uh, cognitive bada a bidet, the ultimate solution right there, baby. Decising the conclusion. I'm just pointing out that this is a direct quote, and this is what their mind adds to the equation. So one of the craziest things that y'all need to understand is if you're trying to fix your life, you need to pay extra, extra, extra attention to what your life, I mean, your mind adds to the equation. Yes. And I see this all the time. These are the cognitive distortions we're talking about. If you ask someone out and they say, I'm not looking to date right now. You say, I got rejected, which is sort of true. But is it your fault? Or is it possible they just weren't? Rejection is about consent. The good news is like, you don't have to break someone's consent. They already told you what's up. You don't have to read minds. They rejected you. Awesome. Looking to date. And this is what I see time and time again, is that the world that we live in is shaped by our perception, shaped by our interpretation. Yep. Bubbles. And then we also try to fix things, not recognizing that, number one. And secondly, bubbles are perceptions. Bubbles are your relationships with those perceptions. So you can be in the nature bubble, a bear's in a bubble, a moose is in a bubble. We're all in bubbles because we're all in the bubble of our perception. Not recognizing what's in here. Right. And this is where, like, y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, we had an awesome interview when we were starting out with this guy, I think, named Crucif. I hope he's doing okay. The voice actor. <sighs> And so we talk a little bit about how he like this rubber band mechanic, which is that anytime it's, it's kind of like he's tied to a tree with a rubber band. And the further he gets away from the tree, the more progress he makes, the more elasticity there is in the rubber band. And then he snaps back. So if you have some kind of pattern in your life where like you snatch defeat from the jaws of victory or something keeps on screwing you up and no matter how hard you try, something is messing things up. You need to look within yourself because there may be things down there that you're not aware of. You may be self-sabotaging in some way. And that's why we talk about emotional True. awareness, emotional processing, healing. Therapists are good at that kind of thing. And this is what it takes. It's a combination of, first of all, staying alive. Secondly, getting some help. Thirdly, working on your emotions, especially as men, right? So if, if I made a, a, a lecture about women's suicide, it would be different. 
and why don't I make this lecture about general suicide? I mean, some of this stuff is generally applicable. It's because, shockingly, I do not think that our research papers on general suicide may apply 100% to women. I think that women deserve their own suicide lecture. The reason that I'm doing one on autism and one on ADHD instead of suicide is because I think that's a bigger problem that women struggle with, at least based on the data that I've seen. Mm. And you do these three things, and, like, you will be amazed at how good your life can get. And I say this as someone who's helped 97 out of 100 people. Like, and they come in, and they've been in bad shape, bro. Ladies, all of the above. Men, women, whatever. And most of them can get better. You just need the right kind of help. Mm. Questions? So here's, here's, a, here's a good... Great, 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 great. I have big goals, but no talent. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. So notice. So someone in chat typed, I have big goals, but no talent. What the fuck does that even mean? What the fuck does that mean? Right? Like, just notice how reflexive that thought is. Mm. Like self-sabotage, It bro. is so... No, three people aren't dead. <laughs> three people, I just don't think I helped in a significant clinical way. And I, I mean, I heard one of them is doing well. The other two, I'm not sure. You know, so I, I think this is where like you've got to be super careful because like if y'all look at me and, and just just like look at the people like what does that mean? What does it mean to be talented? Mm. Like I, I don't know what that means. I don't even th I'm not, I don't identify as a talented person. Maybe that's wrong, but in my mind, when I think of like a talented person, I kind of do think like Savanti. I think of somebody who's like, and not that you don't have to work to co hone, in, hone in your talent. But somebody who has like a natural disposition towards one, maybe. I don't identify as a talented person. I identify as a resilient, efficient, independent, uh, confident person. I never thought I needed talent to be successful because I never felt like I had it. I felt like talent was like, you know, you got a thing, like a thing. I never felt like I had a thing, you know. But I never felt like I needed a talent to be successful. And obviously the proof is in the pudding. I didn't. <laughs> How do you measure talent? I don't know. So I know we have this concept of talent. And the biggest problem with I have big goals but no talent. So I'll give you all one very concrete tip. Be very careful about conclusions about your life that your mind gives you that are not actionable. True. Super careful. See, when the mind doesn't work. The mind different from the consciousness. My brain will give me thoughts about myself that I'm like, what? That's not even true. You know? And that's why DBT was so helpful because it taught me the difference between me and my thoughts. Like me, the consciousness, and the thoughts that I was having or the thoughts that I would hear my brain say to me. I was, I learned the difference between what my brain was saying and what my consciousness actually thought about those things. Because I used to think I was my trigger. I used to think I was my medical issue. I used to think I was my intrusive thoughts. And then I realized like, oh, that's not even me, girl. I don't even believe those things. But like I hear them anyways, whether I like it or not. Not like hearing voices in your head, but like, you know, you're thinking. If you guys have an inner monologue, you know what I mean. But, you know, yeah. Maybe this is Brittany. I think your resilience is your talent, to be honest. I mean, maybe. Want to do something. What it does is gives you an explanation. Yes. Lindsay says the religious bubble says, what is your calling? I like that premise. I think I am doing my calling. But yeah, I like that. What is your calling? I do think I'm doing my calling. That allows you to give up. So it says you need talent to succeed in this world and you have no talent. The construction of the world that you put together logically concludes to not act. Anytime your mind does that, you need to be super careful because chances are there's something else controlling things behind the scene. I'm not saying that it's wrong because it's never wrong. It's just selective, usually. Mm. So this is where, like, I hear this all the time. It's something that I literally look for. I mean, so those of you all that, you know, will watch my interviews and stuff, like, you're like, how, how does this guy do this? It's because I look for these kinds of things. I look for statements that are, like, you know, conclusions about the world that make it impossible to act. Mm. Like, there's no point in trying. Yeah. Right? If you view the world that way. Is that self-defeatist, bro? It's the self-defeatist thing. That like that's what I'm saying. Some people aren't meant to be helped at the time in which they're seeking false help. I don't help people that are lying about needing help. So people will be like, I'm ready to be helped. I'm ready to be helped. But every solution you give them, no, that can't be it. No, I can't do that. No, they always find a reason why that's not the answer for them. Like they're not ready. They're not ready. And they might never be, right? Because life is like moments of time. And this moment might last a lifetime. But I don't waste time like... Oh, my God. Even recently, I was so relieved. I had a caller for the longest time. We were doing philosophy work together. 
And I thought it was going really well, but holy shit, every solution, there was always an excuse. No, that's not it. That's not it. I'm like, Jesus, no gratitude, no humility. It was always everyone's fault, but there's no, like just Jesus Christ. I was so relieved when our calls ended. I was like, bro, this is not a vibe. And it's just like, dude, and it, it was like a philosophy issue, but it was an introspective, like he was getting in his own way. And like no one could stop him. And girl, I wasn't about to, you know. Difference between people who accomplish things and people who don't <sighs> accomplish things. I'm not saying success. What do I mean by accomplish? Accomplish is to set your mind to a goal and actually achieve it. The biggest difference is some people view the world in ways that allow them to act, and some people view the world in ways that do not allow them to act. Mm. Literally, mm. spend some time reading stuff on the internet. You know, people mm -hmm. asking for help and go line by line and analyze, is this, is this actionable? Is this actionable? Is this actionable? Is this actionable? And what you will find is the overwhelming number of people who are stuck have mm. nothing that is actionable. That's how mm. they see their life. But does that mean that their life is not actionable? No, that just means that that's the way that they conceptualize it. Okay. Yeah, so the, the, the man who says I can and the, the man who says I can't are usual. Both the man who says I can, both the, the person who says I can and the person who says I can't are both right. You're right. I completely agree. Right? It's the question is which one does your mind tell you? Mm. Because oftentimes as an individual, you don't think both at the same time. You think one or the other. How to change it. Great question. So you guys can watch the thousand plus. I mean, Jesus, I don't even know. Like, Right? So if you watch our stuff, we teach you all of these individual cases of how to understand your perception, how to understand your mind, this particular complex in the mind, that particular complex in the mind. Here's how ADHD works. Here's some interesting thing about ADHD. Here's this thing about ADHD and obesity. We've got all this stuff for y'all. So you just have to start going through it. Like, I, I don't know how to tell you. I can't condense everything that I've taught into like three minutes. But, but, I'll try. <laughs> okay. So the first thing to understand is awareness is key. So here's the thing. See, a lot, and maybe we'll, we'll wrap after this. The reason that life is hard to live is because we're blind. Like, just think about this. When you can see and you understand what the problems are, then life becomes easy. Yeah. It is when we misunderstand what the problems are that life becomes hard. Yeah. So in Sanskrit, they say that avidya, or ignorance, is the root of our suffering. Mm -hmm. And then you may say, but I understand what my problems are. They're just impossible to solve. And that's why I would say, I don't think you understand them correctly. Ooh, based. This is so true. You think you understand your problem. Life is easy, bro, when you have the answers. The conflict within the self and the conflict within others is when we don't have the right answers or not ready to hear them. That is so fucking true. Which is where all the conflict comes in. And because everyone has different answers. And then, no, like, that's why I say the truth will set you free. The actual truth will set you free. It is so difficult. The truth will set you closer to your joy. Will set you closer to understanding. And, like, the truth is too hard for us. So what we do is we create, like, a somewhat truth. Like he said, it's still true, but it's not the full truth. But we cling to that sort of, sort of truth. Because it's easier than going for the real truth. The whole right, truth. Because if you look at someone who's, there are all kinds of people who will, let's say I'm playing League of Legends. And I say, my God, this game is impossible to win. But some diamond player or some pro player will show up and will be like, this game isn't impossible to win. You just don't understand. Right? So when we go through life, like, there's so many things about our life that we just don't understand. We're not aware of our internal programming. We're not aware of what, we why we wake up on one day and why we. We think we understand it because it's weird to think we don't. It is so difficult to think you don't understand something that you feel like should be easy enough to understand. And it's so, hum like, there's so much humility that goes into understanding you don't know, which brings you to a place of knowing in a way that's so different. You sleep late the other day. Why we procrastinate today and why we work tomorrow. Just think for a second. Why do you procrastinate today and why do you work tomorrow? Or work today and procrastinate tomorrow? Do you even understand something so simple as why you procrastinate? Well, holy shit, if you don't understand such a fundamental thing about you, imagine how hard your life is. Imagine how easy your life would be if you could understand why you procrastinate. Because once you understand what the drivers of procrastination are, then you can actually do something to disable it. So the biggest problem right now is that we don't understand ourselves. So it's like we're playing the game of life, where, but we're blind, and the buttons keep changing. So we're trying to figure out how do I get this character to move, and it's like you hit this button and today it moves. But then it's like one of these, I don't know, these games where like, you know, you get like drunk or whatever, and then all the controller inputs change. Like, that's what life is like. We're playing one of these games where all the controller inputs keep changing. And you have to figure out which buttons do what, and you can't get yourself to do something. Imagine that you could get yourself to do whatever you wanted. <laughs> what would your life look like? Right, and now we come full circle, because I've spent a lot of time talking about objective things and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I think the biggest gain that you can get is just to understand how to control yourself. Yeah. What could you accomplish if you could just control yourself? But control is about having a relationship with yourself. You don't want to trap yourself. You know, you don't have to be, you don't need to be David Goggins that, like, 
traps himself into running 20 miles a day instead of taking an ADHD pill. Not that he should have to take the ADHD pill. Like your choice is your choice. But don't trap yourself in order to control yourself. Have a proper balance with discipline so you can actually like control and be in charge of your life in a way that feels freeing. You want to be free. You don't want to be trapped in my opinion. That is my goal at least to feel free and not trapped. And in order to feel free, I have to learn to have a good relationship with myself. Me, myself. I can't control what other people do. I can only control my relationship with myself and then my boundaries and my my choices with other people, right? I can exit. That's why I'm saying like move out of your parents' house if it's making you miserable because the only thing you can control is you, not them. That's it. And so that's what you should work on. How do you understand how to control yourself? You start by being aware of yourself, right? You can't figure out what buttons do what until you look at the controller and you see which buttons are even there. Awareness, awareness, awareness. And the problem in our society today is that we are so unaware, literally. We spend so much time listening to stuff and then I'm walking and I'm listening to a podcast in the shower and then I'm you know, listening to a podcast when I'm driving and then when I get home and I'm sitting when I'm waiting for my friends to show up, I'm playing a game on my cell phone. We don't spend any time with ourselves. True. We externalize our attention constantly. True. And so we lose sight of ourselves and then life becomes hard. So spend a little bit more time with yourself. Gain as much awareness of yourself as you can. And don't, if you give up hope, I mean, I think it's okay. Like ideally don't do it. But just because you don't have hope doesn't mean that things can't get better. This just means that you're unable to feel hope in this moment. And in my overwhelming experience as a mental health professional, people's lives get better overwhelming experience and this is for people who've even been 60 and said in my life i've been depressed my whole life i've seen them get better the main thing that you may need is a little bit of help and that's just what life is like it's in my mouth happy persian new year everybody cool <laughs> oh what guru dr k oh my god mm. see the problem so gurus are great I'm a big fan the problem is that we don't know which ones are good. So a real guru, I think, is worth a ton. Read everything, listen to everyone, take what you can, throw out the rest. It's just like, imagine, I imagine everyone's a library, and I'm just reading all the books, and I'm taking what I can learn, and I'm throwing out the rest. Even with me, if 90% of my shit is bullshit to you, cool, throw it out, and only keep the 10% that's good to you, bro. Okay. All these fucking gurus, all these priests, all these Bibles, all these religions, all these fucking body keeps a score. Who fucking cares, bro? Read it, but don't worship it. Don't worship anything. Don't worship gods. Don't worship people. Don't worship your mom. Just fucking learn what you can. Maybe you can find one, but they're hard to find. And the problem is that we- Be a chronic student. Everyone's so eager to be the teacher. And the best position to be in is the student. You don't have the ability to judge. So, Andy Buck is saying this is like free therapy. So this is what this is the other thing that I'll say. I mean, this isn't therapy. You guys like this? This, this isn't therapy. therapy. This is nothing like therapy. This is literally nothing like therapy. Everyone who's like, this Dr. K is doing therapy. Brittany's doing therapy. Guys, this is nothing like therapy. None of you have been to therapy. Every nobody knows what therapy is. This isn't therapy. You'll, be, you'll love it. So this is where if we look at the mental health interventions, right? So what are we trying to do here at Healthy Gamer? I kind of gave you all this analogy that being a psychiatrist or therapist is like being a member of the King's Guard or Queen's Guard. Like we're the last line of defense, right? So if we kind of look at suicidality. All this stuff happens in someone's life. And this is the last line of defense over here. This is where the therapist sets it, steps it. So we're the last line of defense, but all this needs to be changed. And the other problem that I have with assuming that therapy is all of the answers all the time is that I don't think it fixes all those things. As a society, I think we need to understand that the reason that an unprecedented amount of men are killing themselves, and by the way, when we say unprecedented, it's not that much worse than it used to be. Because the other really crazy thing is male suicide rates have been super high for like the last almost 100 years, 50 years at least. This has been going on for a while. It's getting worse and it's a problem, don't get me wrong, but it's also been going on for a while. I think the problem is that if we say that therapy is always the answer, and I think therapy is the first step for the majority of people, hands down. But I think we've got to be super careful because the moment that we say that this is a mental illness, we also absolve society of responsibility. Like, I, I think if you lack self-esteem and you're suicidal, you should absolutely get mental health help. But I think we should also help you build a life that is worth living that you can be proud of. But that requires economic opportunity. That requires some ability to connect or requires some ability to connect with other human beings. And this is where we get into the problem of like no individual person is responsible for solving another human being's loneliness. But then who is? Because you can't bootstrap. You can't hug yourself. And it doesn't feel right. Like it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And we've gotten so far to the point of like we're creating dolls and pillows as a hey, substitute hey, hey. for human contact. I like a doll. And it's like, you can you can decry the people who are making it, but like, how the fuck did we get here? The only reason that there's a market for that shit is because human contact is not findable for some people. True. Like, think about that for a second. And the only way this is going to work is if we start taking responsibility for each other. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this part. 
I don't know, bro. I want to take responsibility for the people that I have a symbiotic relationship with. Because nobody's entitled to love. You're not entitled to a good life. You're not entitled to existing. I don't even know why you think you're here. I just feel like no one's entitled. And I also feel like the people that are struggling the most, honestly, it starts at home a little bit. Like, what about your parents? What about your siblings, bro? I get all of this met at home. Like, I'm lucky. I get all my hugs. and Like, I can go to my mom and dad if I need a hug. Like, they'll hug me. I don't need a man or a woman. I don't need sex. I could go home to my siblings and be like, bro, I need a hug, bro. When, when my siblings need a hug, they hug me. What do you mean? Like, go home and hug your family. That's why conservatives say to big, have big families. That's why they say to give your, your children siblings so they can have people that they can hug and be with. You know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, I don't know if I'm not convinced, like, a lot of this starts at home. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need to have a church community to hang out with on Sundays. I have a mom I can call whenever I'm bored. Like, I live a country away from my family, and it doesn't even, you know, I could still go hug my my mother-in-law. I could go hug my father-in-law. I could hug my husband. I could hug my cat, you know? It just feels weird to, like, um, to not realize, like, this is starting in our homes. Like, one of the reasons I didn't want to have a child was because I didn't think I could have two of them and I wasn't going to have an only child. You know what I mean? I didn't want to make another only child in the world. A lot of the only children I know are, have their own issues. Even people with siblings have issues, but they're different kinds of issues. So again, I'm not moralizing it. You can have one child if you want. I don't give a fuck. I'm just saying, you know what I mean? A lot of this starts at home. Case says, I don't think he's telling you to do something. He's just saying take responsibility and use your own ability to respond to push things in a more positive direction. Of course. Yeah, of course. Right? Not my problem. Like, yes, you're correct. But whose is it? The only way this works is if you make it your problem. And we can keep on becoming more and more independent and creating more and more facsimiles of human contact. And we're going to get better and better at it. But like, this problem is fixed if we all accept more responsibility for like taking care of each other. Mm. Like, I don't know if you'll see that, right? Like, no. why is all this stuff happening? Because humans are giving up responsibility for each other. You're saying... I got my, what is it? IVFU? So it's a very popular tech company where they have a phrase, I'm vested, fuck you. So after a certain number of years, they get their stock options and then they basically can all retire. And so there's a phrase that would get tossed around, I'm vested, fuck you, right? And this is the society we live in today. It's like, once I get mine, everybody else can go fuck themselves. And this is the attitude because we live in this dog eat dog world. We live in this independent world. We live in this world where like no one helped me, so I'm not gonna help anybody. And like, I can't blame an individual for that. I really can't, I don't. But my, my question is, what happens? What happens? Like, let's play this tape through the end. And that's what we're here for. I don't know what bubble that is, but I don't think that's most of the world. And if it is, like, that started at home, right? Like, what do you mean? You don't help people in your life when they need help? What does that mean? Right? Like, it's about AOE healing. And what's awesome about this community is, like, I can't do it alone. And last thing to consider for those of y'all that are struggling with suicidality is a lot of people think that when you're suicidal, you have no value because you look at some of these objective metrics. So there's one really big value. I mean, there's a lot of value in your life. I think I really believe that. But there's one thing that I, I want to make an argument for, which is that we need you. So if you look at the data, what you find is that peer support is very helpful. Mm. And honestly, like, this is such a weird thing. I was thinking about this and I was like, why don't we have peer support for suicidality? We have peer support for alcoholism. We have peer support for all these things. What about peer support for suicidality? That's when they hit me. Oh, yeah, they all kill themselves. No, 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 no. Some of my favorite friends are people who also want to kill themselves. I love, oh, my God, have you ever seen those TikToks where it's like you're hanging out with your friends? You're like, ugh, I just want to kill myself this weekend. They're like, oh, same. And then everyone's like, you guys talk about killing yourselves? No, some of my best friends have been suicidal. That's some of the best support is to talk to other suicidal people that are like, man, I just want to die this weekend. Bro, me too. Ugh, let's not do it though. Let's watch Netflix. And it's like you're with somebody who's miserable and you're so depressed. But like some of the best reassurance I've ever got in my life is from people that have attempted or want to kill themselves, but they're figuring it out. You know what I mean? Because there's a stage, you know, before you kill yourself. There's like the thinking about it. And then there's the kind of slow attempt. And then there's the, hmm, you know. So now we have a unique problem when it comes to suicidality, which is that we don't have survivors to show the rest of us how to survive. You guys are not hanging out in the right groups. So we need a crop of people. I'm serious. When I say need, I say that with a capital N, who can get through what you've gone through, and then hopefully you can put together your life. And then there's, there's literally a 287% increase in people under the age of 18, 287% increase of people who need you. And this is, this is what we're noticing, right? So this is what we learned from things like, let's just take a quick aside into alcohol research, right? I'm not doing a full thing. I'm making some conclusions and there's arguments and stuff. When you look at alcohol, alcoholism, 
We have great evidence-based treatments. And the majority of people get sober on their own or with AA. They don't come to medical professionals. So we have good treatments, but the majority of people do without us. And so peer support is crucial. So like, like literally, I mean, I, I say like we need people who know what it's like to be suicidal and put together your life and then show us the way. That's me. Watch my channel. But also, for me, my method was like introspection. And my why? Why am I here? Why am I even alive? Who told me I'm obligated to stay alive? I'm sick of hearing that, bro. It's annoying. You have to stay alive. For why? Because I'm... Because therapists can do a lot, but we cannot substitute for personal experience. This is what we've learned from peer support. So when we look at evidence-based models of addiction treatment, one is go see your psychiatrist and then go to AA, a refuge recovery or whatever, smart recovery, whatever your choice of peer support is. Right? These two things are not replaceable. Right? So do the best that y'all can. I'm here. I literally say all the time, like, oh my God, I want to die. My fibro is killing me. Discourse says chronic pain makes us want to die sometimes. True. Like all the time. I'm literally like, I want to die. My fibro, I want to die. It's like all we're saying is like, I want to die could also mean like, I want to rest. I want peace in my life. I, this is a lot. I'm overwhelmed. I just want it to stop, you know? Here to help you as much as I can, right? I don't, I mean, the whole reason I did this is because I felt like it wasn't enough to see people in my office. So unfortunately, I can't see all in my office. And also fortunately, like I'm here because of that, right? And, and like go and go and, and give a shot. Like go get help and give yourself a pat on the back and be patient with yourself and recognize that just because objectively that your life has sucked up until this moment, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm also saying you can't predict the future. Sorry. So don't give up. I know it's hard, like to a certain extent, as much as I can having lived the life that I've lived. And like give it a shot. Like you just don't know. I mean, like we as human beings, we're so arrogant. We think we know the future. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The world may end tomorrow. Or maybe someone will, will release, oh, like, psych, it's not Elden Ring DLC, it's Elden Ring 2. And then suddenly the suicidality disappears, right? There's like, we don't know what life has to offer. And life is hard for a lot of people right now, but like, holy crap, like, we could be on, the, maybe you can go to Mars in your lifetime, like, that's pretty cool. Just give it a shot, don't give up. And we need your help, because we can't do it without you. I can't do it without you, right? We need you. So thank you all very much for coming today. And uh, yeah, I, I'll say, just to clarify, because I think some people on Twitter didn't understand, I am not for suicide. <laughs> I'm for living and trying to put your life together. And I sincerely believe that you can have a life that is worth living. And if you haven't been able to make one, that's okay. And also like try to find someone to help you. Right? That doesn't doesn't mean like even if you feel some shame, have your therapist work through that with you. Mm. All right, take care guys. All right. Good live show. Easy peasy. That was good. Oh my gosh, guys, thank you for being here with me. I'm so sorry. My my I think I am like trying to fight a migraine here. It isn't a full bowl of migraine. I wouldn't be able to function if it was. But I feel it coming, so I should probably take a uh, – I should probably stop streaming. Um, I'll come back tomorrow. We have lots to cover tomorrow. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get going. I think Dr. K said it all. I think my commentary was useful. I just don't think I'll give good commentary at this point. My head is pounding. Um, treat yourselves well. If you can't solve the problem, get the tools to solve it. And, uh, you know, all that, uh, something positive, uh, your mom and, um, uh, I love you. Okay. I'll talk to you tomorrow. In my head, in real life while I'm dead, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm Sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, dun, dun.